Hey, good evening everybody. Welcome to Atwood Unleashed 114, co-hosted by Stephen Knight. And we have got a hell of a lineup for you, including thousand-year-old alien petrified corpses, JFK, <laughs> breaking news on JFK. We've got um, the agent that was in the back of the vehicle, the behind JFK, the vehicle behind JFK. We've got, we're going to be reporting on that story. And we have got four hours of content coming across the whole YouTube version tonight. So stay tuned. First guest is from 6630. Cleveland-based lawyer James Robino, off of four books, recently wrote on Vanity Fair about breaking news regarding the JFK assassination as the lead up to the 60th anniversary begins. Tonight's talking points include ex-Secret Service agent Paul Landis, who was feet away from John F. Kennedy when the former president was shot dead. Landis has finally broken his decades-old silence cast out on the single bullet theory held by the commission which investigated the assassination. 6.30 to 7, Pulitzer Prize winner and national security reporter for the Washington Post, Joby Warwick, is joining us off of two books, The Red Line, Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS, ooh, and The Triple Agent. The season reporter will be stopping by to discuss the unravelling of Syria and what part the CIA played in removing chemical weapons. Well, we know that they played a huge part in getting Western countries engaged in false wars so that the likes of the Bush, Clinton, Blur crime families could make billions and billions in contracts, millions off the back of it. Absolute scum. Bombing the poorest countries in the world, hundreds of thousands dead, half of them women and kids, and calling it collateral damage. Yeah, I don't approve of that in the slightest. All right, Stephen, you're at seven. Yeah, from seven to 7.30, friend of the show, Eric Hunley, will be adding his insights to the new JFK news. Someone in the comments just said they love the JFK stuff, lots of it this evening. Uh, Eric is one half of America's Untold Stories YouTube channel with Mark Gruber, which, which explores history and pop culture that is often unknown, obscure or overlooked. Eric is also the host of Unstructured and the eponymous YouTube channel Eric Hunley, where he interviews a wide variety of folks from body language experts to YouTube lawyers uh, to people in three letter agencies. Uh, and then following straight on from that at 7.30 to 8, I'll be speaking to Michelle Rowland, who has lost her child to a cult in the United States. Uh, Michelle will be discussing how the cult, which originated on the West Coast of the States, now operates in more than 150 countries, apparently. Uh, she will also be chatting to us about the cult leader, Kit McKean, uh, who has founded several destructive cult movements over the last 40 years. Uh, the two cults we will be focusing on tonight are the International Christian Church, the ICC, and the International Church of Christ, the ICOC. Uh, fascinating. And then from 8 to 8.30... Uh, the Cold War TV YouTube channel is one of the most so informative history channels on the social media platform. Uh, today, the host, David, will be dropping in to walk us through the CIA's Operation Mongoose, where they attempted to assassinate Fidel Castro and which was sanctioned by President Kennedy. Really looking forward to that one. And then from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, it's true crime writer, researcher and analyst Sarah Bax Horton. Uh, she'll be dropping by to speak about her new book, one Arm Jack. Uh, Sarah previously served in the Foreign Office. Uh, during her time in the Foreign Office, she developed a fascination with genealogy and the Whitechapel murders, which led her to write her new book, one Arm Jack, about the Jack the Ripper mystery, which I've read and it's fantastic. So looking forward to talking about that. Finally, we're going to have an hour on the Gambino crime families. Sammy the Bull from 9 to 10 with Billy Luna, who's put out some videos on Sammy. We're going to be talking about his early years, how he was with the Colombo crime family before the Gambinos. We're going to be talking about the execution of the boss, Big Paul Castellano, with John Gotti. 
We're going to be talking about, there's a story in his book that fascinated me where he has a run-in with a Czech coke dealer and there's a threats over this club that they're trying to buy and then Sammy executed him without Big Paul's permission, which created a situation. Um, but it's the, one of the most fascinating stories is how they coordinate the assassination of Big Paul himself. We're also going to be talking about Sammy the Bull's involvement in the ecstasy ring in Arizona. Sound familiar? And that's going to be, I'm going to have tons of questions for Billy Luna at 9 to 10. But I can tell Stephen is gagging to go over <laughs> to the headline. Thousand-year-old alien corpses displayed in glass cases in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of an embarrassment, embarrassing one for me, this, because I've been very strident in my anti-alien beliefs. I, I'm a pure skeptic. I'm the Dana Scully in this situation, but they, they've got me. The Mexicans have done me. They have provided genuine, cast-iron, 100% flawless proof <laughs> of the existence of extraterrestrials and made me look a right muppet. Uh, so you heard it here first. I'm a convert. Um, the truth is out there, people. Uh, it's all over. The game's up. The Mexicans have aliens, right, Sean? Indeed. <laughs> if you look at the picture here, it does look like a shrunken E.T. Um, I'll... Here's the story on at Sky. Two alleged non-human alien copses alleged. have been shown to Mexican politicians. The mummified specimens were displayed in glass cases as part of an official unveiling at Mexico's Congress in a hearing which has stirred excitement among UFO enthusiasts, of which Stephen is not included. Politicians <laughs> were told they were found in the city of Coscu, Peru, and were estimated to be a thousand years old. They look like they were bought from Costco. That's the problem. <laughs> the Mexico City event was spearheaded by journalist and UFO researcher Jamie Musan, who testified under oath that almost a third of their DNA is unknown, and the specimens were not part of our terrestrial evolution. Mexican media reported, although it doesn't say which Mexican media reported, these specimens are not part of our evolutionary history on Earth, he said in his presentation to Mexican government officials and representatives from the US, unnamed. They are not beings recovered from a UFO crash. Instead, they were found in diatom, algae mines, and subsequently became fossilized. However, a 2015 claim by Mr. Mausan that a mummified body purportedly that of an alien found near Nazca in Peru was later debunked as it was shown to be a human child. What do you think that, of that, Stephen? Very dark ending to what was otherwise a harmless story. But no, I mean, it did. this story did get community noted on Twitter. I don't know if you're aware of this now, but people can add context to tweets on Twitter and provide sources. And apparently these have already been debunked. But this is quite sinister in the way that he's actually being accused of potentially using bits of remains of humans dug up from indigenous graves to kind of make his... His uh, tiny little weird looking alien ET emaciated action figures, which is what they appear to be. Um, more information needed, I would say. Like the Museum of Curiosities that they used to have in the 1800s, early 1900s, where they would show all kinds of alleged aliens, um, deformities, etc. The lengths that people will go to to obtain a large amount of attention via a hoax should not be underestimated. It, history is full of people sowing monkeys to half this, half that to try and claim they found the missing link. You know, no, no shortage of people trying to prove mermen and mermaids and things like that, and all debunked, of course. So I suspect it's possibly a similar thing this time. Speaking about latest discovery, Mr. Malsan told the Mexico City delegation the specimens had been examined at the Autonomous National University of Mexico, where scientists use radiocarbon dating to gather DNA evidence 
and x-rays had shown one to have eggs inside. <laughs> Congress representatives said the information had left them with thoughts and concerns and with the view to continue talking about this. Ryan Graves, former US Navy pilot, in July claimed the number of UFOs was being grossly underreported, was also in attendance. And last year marked the 75th anniversary of the Roswell UFO incident, which still attracts theories to this day. Whereby an extraterrestrial spacecraft is said to have crashed in the desert of New Mexico in 1947, leading to the possible recovery of alien bodies, which theorists claim has been covered up by the American government. Wow. Right. Anything to add to that one, Stephen? No, no, I don't think I do. I'll be honest. Um, no, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, the fact that it's the fact that a, a sincere claim of possession of alien carcasses has had no impact on the news cycle should give you some indication as to how seriously this has been taken outside of Costco in Mexico, <laughs> wherever it is. <laughs> All right, our first guest, James, is about to come in. So we will see Stephen in an hour or so. Cheers, my friend. Have a good one. And huge thank you to everyone who's signed up for our locals. Our locals is now almost at a thousand. Link is in the description box below this video. And James is a Cleveland-based lawyer, off of four books, and recently wrote on Vanity Fair about the breaking news regarding the JFK assassination as the lead up to the 60th anniversary begins. Talking points are going to focus on ex-Secret Service agent Paul Landis, who was feet away from Kennedy when the president, former president was shot dead. Landis has broken his decades-old silence to cast doubt on the single bullet theory held by the commission, which investigated the assassination. So, without any further ado, let's bring him in. Hello, Jim. How are you doing, Hello. my friend? Good, Sean. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you loud and clear. Your audio is excellent, thank you. Good, great, nice to be with you. Thank you, and can you just tell the viewers, I did say a little bit about you, but can you just add a little bit more about what your work is, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm an attorney. I've written four history books. I'm really a presidential historian. Um, and in the last four months, I've been working with this former Secret Service agent, uh, Paul Landis, on his forthcoming book called The Final Witness. And so I've been working with him to take him through his paces, if you will, about why he didn't come forward till now. Does it work? Is it possible? Is it probable? And um, so that's why I wrote the Vanity Fair piece, piece, which is the longest thing I'll ever write in a magazine. It's like 8,000 words, um, but I'm proud of it. So why has he waited this long to speak out? Yeah, you know, it's uh it's the question that everybody is asking it's what i first asked I, and i'll tell you this came to me through my publisher who was publishing paul's book coincidentally and they said could you read this and sign a non-disclosure agreement and i said wow what do i have to sign a non-disclosure agreement about but i did i read it and it, by the time i finished it where he talked about picking up the bullet i was just like man i'm not sure i believe this um so i i as we'll say, as we'll talk about, I spent a lot of time testing it out and trying to figure out if it's true or not. But um, he didn't come forward for two real reasons. The first is that um, in the week after the assassination, remember, he was just behind the president's car in Dallas. He was 15 feet away. He saw Kennedy's head explode. And um, then they raced to the hospital where he gets into the limousine to try to get Jackie to release JFK, she's holding him in her lap. She will not move. She will not let him go. Uh, finally, Clint Hill, his other Secret Service agent for Jackie, takes off his coat, puts it over the president. She'll finally let him go. When she stands up, that's when he sees the bullet. And we can talk about that. But during that week, he is in a complete tornado. He leaves the bullet with the president's body, thinking the autopsy is going to be done. This needs to be here. And he walks out into the hallway and Jackie Kennedy is sitting there, blood splattered, including her face still. Um, and he's got to protect her, secure the area. He forgets about that bullet. He doesn't think about it. He left it where he thought he should leave it. And then he's, you know, then it's just one event after another. They're on the way out to 
love field to, to bring the casket back to Washington. They get there, you'll see Paul helping unload the casket into a hearse. He's in the front seat of the hearse while Bobby Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy are in the back seat. 45 minute ride to uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital where they will do an autopsy and then get his body ready for burial. Um, and he's up all night again. And so he's at five in the morning, they're taking the body back to the White House. That entire week was like that. No sleep, complete, completely traumatized. The, um, the loop of the president's head exploding is going in his head over and over. Uh, and then they go up to um, Tahiana's port to see uh, JFK's father and mother with Jackie and the kids. And it's during that time he writes his two reports. He's in no shape to write a report. Um, he really was completely unreliable at that point. He did his best, but he doesn't mention the bullet because he didn't really think much about it. Nobody was concerned about it at that point. And then after that, he begins uh, protecting Jackie for the next six months, and he can't do it. He can't sleep at night. He finally quits. The Warren Commission never knocks on his door, and they should have. Um, and he leaves, and he's leaving because he cannot think about it anymore. He's trying to get away from all of it. And so he leaves it all behind. Warren Commission report isn't even out. Nobody has even said the word single bullet theory. Um, and he spends the next number of years just avoiding it completely, even though it's saturating, you know, the, the uh, media and so forth. He avoids it. He said, I was there. I don't need to know, read what somebody else says about it. So um, he never read the, read the Warren Commission report. He assumed they got it right. Um, but he didn't know that they had gotten it really wrong until 50 years later, uh, 2014, on the, essentially the 50th anniversary of the Warren Commission report. He finally reads a book. And when he reads the book, he sees that they said that this bullet that he brought in and put on JFK's stretcher, the Warren Commission said it was on Conley's stretcher to accommodate their single bullet theory. That is, it goes through JFK, transit through his neck, hits Conley, causes all this damage to bones, lands in his leg and then falls off on the stretcher. And they said it was found on his stretcher. And Paul's like, no, I brought that in. That's not what happened. So at that point, he started calling people he uh, trusted and said, I've got to write something. This, I've got to correct this. And that was the journey. And that's why it, it took this long. What have been the most fascinating elements of this for you, Jim? You know, I think um just the personal aspect you know paul and i have spent like 15 sessions together two hours and we sit down he's 88 he's got a better memory than i do he works out every morning he plays golf once a week he's he's in remarkable shape um but it's that personal aspect as we're talking about it and i'm trying to understand his mindset and let me just give you one example of this at the end of that first week um he flies up to Hyannisport with Jackie and the kids, as does Clint Hill. And they're meeting with, you know, John F. Kennedy's father, who had had a stroke, Joe Kennedy and Rose Kennedy and the family up there. And, and Jackie's going up there. Jackie was particularly close with Joe Kennedy. Um, history tells us that, that Joe liked her a lot and she liked Joe. And so this was just absolutely devastating time. And what fascinates me, for example, is that Friday, which is the week after the assassination, a guy named Theodore White comes up and interviews her. Jackie allows him to come up and interview her. He's a life um, journalist, Life magazine. And he shows up late at night on Friday. It's raining. It's 830 at night. She's in there with some other people around, including Paul and uh, Clint Hill. And he comes in to interview her and takes her, you know, kind of gets an interview for Life magazine that is until 2.30 in the morning. And that interview is what's known today as the Camelot interview, where she talks about Camelot. And that's why JFK's time is known as Camelot. It's that interview that night that she gives. But boy, if you read Theodore White's notes that are online uh, about it, it was like insanity that this what she lived through describing the skull and watching his head explode and talking about what she wanted to do and and what was going to happen it's really like you walk into a moment of insanity um where this woman somehow is keeping it together but not really you know she seems quite insane in some respect that she's dealing with all this and so 
to me, the most fascinating aspect is that, because what I've said to people is that assassination, those shots, that six seconds in Dallas, it's like somebody turned on an insanity switch in our body politic. And it's not been turned off since in some way, shape or form that is still haunting us. And, you know, and, you know, has a lot to do, in fact, with our current day politics. So that's what's most fascinating to me. What are your theories as to what actually happened then? Yeah, so this is what I had to do. Um, first, I had to think, is Paul, you know, he's 88. Is he still with it? That was very quickly uh, and easy to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and two, is he telling the truth? Is there any reason for him to be lying about it? The answer is no. He's 88 years old. You know, he doesn't need money. It, this is him really coming to grips with all of it. Um, so I had to look at that. But then I had to go further because Paul doesn't know the facts. When he wrote this book, he didn't go and read a bunch of stuff because he didn't want it to influence what he wrote. So he doesn't know, for example, what the autopsy results were. He didn't know that. Um, and I had to go look at that stuff and say, does this make sense given what we know and given what the Warren Commission said? And so what I found was sure enough, it makes a lot of sense when you know, you know, first you accept that what he says is true. He found the bullet on top of the the backseat car on the ledge that goes to the trunk. And you can see Jackie patting his back at the, when the final shot comes. She probably knocked it onto her clothing and then she goes out to reach over um, the trunk to grab a piece of his scalp that had been blown off. She actually does get it and gives it to the Parkland doctors. Um, but where she stretches out the most is right where Paul found that. So, okay, that makes sense. But then, you know, what about the autopsy? So if you go to the autopsy that night, what's really interesting is there are two guys, uh, FBI guys that J. Edgar Hoover had told to go out and meet the body at, at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, follow the ambulance to Bethesda, stay with that casket the entire time, kind of chain of custody stuff, and be in that autopsy room when it happens, and if they pull out bullets or bullet fragments, you know, get them and bring it back to the FBI lab. So the, it's, it's a guy named Jim Seibert, and his uh, his partner was a guy named Frank O'Neill, Francis O'Neill. And so they're there. They're literally standing like two feet away from the doctors while they're dissecting the body and trying to figure out everything. And what they said was that, you know, they started looking at the head wound and where did the bullet come from the front, the back or whatever. But then they discovered a wound in the back, which nobody knew about. Uh, at Parkland, he died on the table. Nobody turned him over. Um, they didn't look. But they did in Parkland notice there was a wound in front of his neck, right near his tie, that they used to create a tra tracheostomy, um, tracheotomy. And so they cut it much wider to put in a trach tube to try and keep him breathing. Uh, it was desperate. It was it, uh, not going to do anything. But the, the doctors at Bethesda looked at that wound and said, oh, that's a tracheotomy. They didn't realize it was covering a wound in the front. So that night they were like, hmm, there's this bullet hole in the back. Well, then they, what they, the autopsy people do, they put their finger in it and it could only go about to the first knuckle of the small finger. It was shallow. And then they take a probe, which are they doing these things? And they just started a probe and it only went a little ways in. There was no path. And I don't know if you've seen some of these gruesome photos of, of shootings where they, they have these probes that go all the way through to show the bullet path of somebody. They couldn't do that. And they were puzzled. Where did this bullet go? They did x-rays. There's no x-rays in the body. So they, they then um, heard that there was a bullet found on a stretcher in Parkland that night. The FBI called back to the office and they were told about this. One of these two guys came in and said, hey, there's a, there's a stretcher bullet that they're that they've brought back here to Washington. And the doctor said, aha, that must be this shallow wound in the back that when he was down and they were doing cardiac massages, it must have pushed it out the back onto his stretcher. That's how they ended the night. They did not section the shoulder. They didn't section the front to see if there was a path. Um, and so, and by the way, the wound was down lower on the shoulder, not up on the neck, which is where the Warren Commission had to put it in order for it to be the right, you know, trajectory. So it's down there. They send the body back to the White House. They no longer have it. The next morning, the autopsy doctors call Parkland, which they should have called that night. I mean, they absolutely should have called him that night. 
but this guy was like 38 years old. He's a Navy pathologist. who have never done a ballistics thing. So they called Parkland and the guy said, oh, well, what do you think about the wound in the front? And he said, what wound in the front? He said, um, well, there was a wound we used to create the trach. And the guy said, oh, he said, uh, that must have been the exit. So it must have come from the back through the front. Um, but they had nothing to support that. It, it was total conjecture and it doesn't work. The bullet was coming down from up above at an angle, hitting shallow in the back. Um, it's not going to suddenly turn up and come out the front of his neck. Um, so there was a real problem there. But the, you know, the autopsy doctors were like, well, that must have been the exit. And once they did that, then the Warren Commission had a problem because they had to figure out if there was an exit, where did that bullet go? And they couldn't figure it out. There was, you know, it's, so it must have hit Conley, gone through him and landed in his leg where it then fell off on his stretcher. Um, and there's, you know, the biggest problem is that bullet that Paul took in was really undeformed. It had been a shallow wound in the back that had fallen out. Now they have it go through and break the major radius bone in six floor John Conley, uh, a rib five inches, destroys five inches of a rib and it's pristine. You know, that's why people don't believe the, the Warren Commission, that in and of itself. But now that you look at it, you say, well, what that means is the first shot hits Kennedy in the back, falls out. Then there had to be a second shot that hit Conley. And the problem is on the Zabruder film, you see Kennedy come out from behind a sign with his arms coming up um like this and um you know a second later conley reacts that's too fast oswald does not have enough time to to shoot kennedy in the back then click his bolt action because this wasn't an automatic rifle but you know reload aim fire the commission did it many times they said it's at least 2.3 2.5 seconds the fastest you can do without really even aiming um, so there's not enough time. There's only a second between those two. So if a second bullet hit Conley, then you have to consider that there was a second shooter. That's really the bottom line on all this. So is this more evidence of the triangulation theory? You know, um, there, uh, uh, Paul Landis in his statements that he did write thought that the, the final shot came from the front, um, which would have been the, the what so-called grassy knoll. He later said, I must have just heard an echo. You know, he, these guys were all writing reports, revising their thoughts and, and thinking about it more because really they were in such a traumatic tornado at that point. So he later said, I must have just heard a, an echo and I, th they all must have come from the back. Now he's starting to rethink that. But um, I don't know enough to know and he doesn't know enough to know whether or not the ballistics would support a shot from the front and some shots from the back. Um, this triangulation idea that you're talking about could be, but other are going to, other people are going to have to really opine on that. I took it as far as I could take it, just that it makes sense that this bullet was shallow in the back and, and that that's what we do know for sure. So if anyone's got questions for Jim, wherever you are watching this in the world, please put them in the chat and we'll re we'll read out some of the comments as well. So Seago wants to know, why it's took 50 years for certain FBI files to be released to the public, which are still redacted? Yeah, you know, um, the greatest problem with the Kennedy assassination was, was that the family um, was so concerned that they didn't want the public to see the autopsy photos of this dynamic guy, you know, shot to pieces and gruesomely, you know, displayed. And they, they likewise didn't want the x-rays to be out. So the Kennedy family took possession of those things. And even the Warren Commission didn't see the autopsy photos. Think about that. Uh, so they were, they were already starting to put a hold on all this stuff. And that, that permeated this whole idea of whether records were going to be released or not. Part of it is a concern about national security because Oswald was being followed in Mexico and things like that. So a lot of the information they, they had, CIA, FBI, was labeled as top secret. And that was a mistake. I mean, all of that, keeping the photos out, keeping the x-rays out, labeling everything top secret, and then having years and years and years go by before it, it comes out was a huge mistake. And, you know, this is the president of the United States. You get that stuff out, get it out fast. And 
and redact that which you think is is still problematic from a classified documents perspective or top secret documents but that's what happened and it just was um you know it was, it was good intentions went, that that went very wrong especially with the family i mean to this day nobody knows where the brain is um and some suspect that bobby kennedy actually secretly buried it with jfk at some point it's just nuts i mean it's it's too bad because it's it really is self-inflicted wounds nobody knows where the brain is nobody knows where the brain is it was it was once listed in the national archives who has all the materials and nobody can find it right now nobody knows where it is um and again i think this is one of the things that the family probably took possession of and and maybe for religious reasons thought it should be buried with the body or you know near the body or whatever but i don't know that that's that's complete speculation but i can tell you nobody can tell you today where his brain is so kaza wants to know was the upward uh the shot from the window was the trajectory upwards or downwards the shot it was the sixth floor of the book depository building so it was downwards at an angle and the the street actually uh, angled down too and the limousine had to get beyond a tree that was in the way. And so it was over the top of this tree. Um, there are a couple of recreations there online that are, that are pretty accurate that show, you know, the shots coming down in their angle. Rank is asking, could the bullet have deviated in incredible ways upon contact? That happens all the time with bullets um, that, you know, they do strange things in a body, but the one that went allegedly transited JFK didn't hit any bones. So it, it was not going to be turned in its direction. Um, there was no indication that any of these bones were, were broken. There was one little fracture of a, of, uh, of, of a vertebrate that was coming out, but it's a small thing. It would not have diverted it. Once it got into Conley, yeah, I mean, it hit, it hit a rib and then hit a wrist. And so there, yeah, it could have been uh, I, I think it was probably fractured into pieces and, and ricocheted around either in the limo or out of the limousine at that point with one fragment going into his, his leg, which you can still see on uh, Conley's x-ray to this day. There's still a fragment that he was buried with in his, in his leg. Kaz has said the head um, blowing up makes it look like the shot was from the front. Yeah, there's, I mean, this is where things get exceptionally complicated. And there is this real divide between what the doctors saw at Parkland in the emergency room and what the doctors reported um, at the autopsy. And, you know, I'll tell you just fundamentally, the, the people who were in the room with Kennedy when he was brought in, particularly a guy named Robert McClellan, went behind Kennedy to help actually with the trach. And he looked down and he, he said, have you guys seen this head? You know, the whole back of the head was blown off. And he was like, there's nothing we could do here. I mean, there was brain coming out and, you know, et cetera. But he said that the wound that he saw that was, that was massive was in the back of the head, indicating that a shot came from the front, exited out the back. That's what he said. That's what a number of people said at Parkland. Once, it gets, once the body gets to Bethesda, those doctors are saying that the wound, that, that there's a hole in the back and that the wound comes out the front. Um, so I don't know how you, how you square those two stories. They're diametrically opposed and it's one of the problems. Um, there is one, uh, person who I think does a pretty good job with facts, a guy named Josiah Thompson, who's got a book out called the final second, where he proposes that two shots hit the head at the same time, one from the front and one from the back. And there's a, a video you can go watch of him giving a speech on that called the final second. Um, that he just did in the last few years to, to talk about that. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, I'm not expert enough to know. So Grandpa said that uh, he or she believes that there's three to four shooters and was wondering whether one of the shooters could have been the driver. Yeah, that is total bunk. Um, there is um, some people who have the driver, some people who have one of the Secret Service agents in the follow-on car, and Paul was there. And that didn't happen. I mean, that just didn't happen. So, but it certainly has been raised many times that that, that is one explanation, but it's bunk. Kaza wants to know whether the bullet that Landis picked up was in pristine condition? Yes, he's identified it as the one that is identified as Commission Exhibit 399, known as the pristine bullet. 
he picked it up and he was a he was a rifle person from when he was a kid a hunter and he noticed right away that there were striations on it indicating it had been fired um because those are the you know the rifling creates striations on a on a bullet so yeah that is the bullet that he picked up and he he identifies it as the one that he took in and put with the president jet wants to know what reasons the cia is giving for holding on documents that are supposed to have been released by now yeah you know it goes back to what i said earlier they were following oswald um and that you know the fbi had a problem because they were following oswald cia was following oswald secret service really didn't do its job that day in some material respects um but everybody has like you know something to hide as as they say and the CIA knew about what um, what Oswald was doing. They had people following him. They had photographs in Mexico, and you know, I mean, he was he was being watched because he had, he had defected to the Soviet Union. So they had these files, but they didn't share them with the Secret Service. So egg on their face. Um, that's why that doesn't come out. But then over time, we still have stuff that is still marked as top secret national security type stuff that, you know, methods and sources might be disclosed by this, which it is beyond me six years later, but that's why some of it is still being withheld. Verity wants to know whether you have watched JFK X solving the crime of the century. And if so, what do you think about the conclusion? Is that the new Oliver Stone um, documentary? Oh, I don't know. Let me have a quick There was there was one, one that he, you know, he did it. JFK back in 1990, the movie. J but then yeah, he's done a doc one. he's done a documentary in a, a short film recently and, and it could be that one. If it is, I can answer that cuz I have watched it. So it says JFK revisited through the looking glass is Yeah, the that's new... the Oliver Stone. That's the one that I think um has some pretty accurate stuff in it, although he's going to have to revise what he thinks now based on Paul's revelation here too but um i don't think he'll be surprised by it gb is wondering about the rumor of the bush family being involved in this yeah you know that's another one that just is beyond me this there there have been people who have written that prescott bush and others were involved and i just i don't have a clue as to where people are coming up with that and it seems very far-fetched to me but I wouldn't, you know, I don't know is the answer. Um, this is a question from Agent Orange. Do you agree that this incident on a leader should be top secret? This incident on what? The, the, do you do you think that the assassination it should be kept top secret? No, um, I I think that sixty years later it's time to end all of that stuff uh, unless there truly is like some guy still alive in mexico city that they want to protect um but no i mean there's no reason this this it's been much too much of this hiding stuff um and it really you know they when oliver stone's uh film came out they put together what called the assassination um review board for this very reason to get everything out and get it out in the public and it should have happened like last year and there's still some stuff being held it's just it it's not i don't think that makes sense and it's not but i'm you know they may have good reasons i don't know of them so papa chubby is there a direct line between jfk malcolm x and many other social justice advocates who were assassinated that's a that is a great question. I've written about Malcolm X because he came here to my hometown, Cleveland, and gave his final speech called The Ballot or the Bullet. Uh, and that's my fourth book. Actually, it's called Ballots and Bullets, Black Power Politics and Urban Guerrilla Warfare in 1968 Cleveland. Um, so I know about his assassination, and that was pretty much proved to be the Nation of Islam um, because he had broken with Elijah Muhammad and was kind of a marked man. I don't associate that with uh, the forces that wanted to kill JFK if there was a conspiracy beyond Lee Oswald, which I'm not saying I know. I'm just saying I don't associate that with Malcolm X. I do think that um, that Martin Luther King, who I also cover in my fourth book, that Ballots and Bullets book, uh, I do think that his assassination is questionable because he was killed exactly one year to the day after he denounced the Vietnam War. Um, so, 
you know, he was marked too in many ways, but that, that one makes me wonder about, you know, I think JFK's assassins likely are right wing. If, if there is somebody beyond Oswald and likely, you know, maybe even government stuff. And I, you, you sure know that uh, J. Edgar Hoover was following Martin Luther King and blackmailing him and all sorts of other things. And so, I mean, I think there was uh, a reason to get rid of him, but that comes under the heading of total speculation, but, but not Malcolm X. I don't think Malcolm X is tied to it. So with those assassinations, what were the most suspicious elements? I mean, I think uh, the problem with, with all of those assassinations, including Bobby Kennedy. So you got to put JFK, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, Malcolm X. Those are the 1960s, those assassinations. And they're all one way or another political murders. They're people who um, somebody wants to, to silence or get out of the way. And, you know, if you buy that uh, Oswald was a lone gunman, he sort of had political reasons perhaps to do it, even if he was the lone gunman. And certainly Bobby Kennedy's assassination was political. Sirhan Sirhan, if he's the guy who did it, you know, had political reasons. And, and clearly, other than Malcolm X, which I think was an internal fight within the Nation of Islam, um, I, I do think that, you know, uh, Martin Luther King was someone who, you know, was killed of, by probably a white supremacist. And so, again, political reasons. Does Jim agree Oswald was a patsy? <laughs> it's such a famous, you know, he's in the hot, he's in the jail. He, can you imagine these guys marching him back and forth between meetings with all this media? And he, he yells out, I'm just a patsy. Um, by the way, one incredible scene, they bring him down that night to show him to the press because there's a lot of concern that they had beaten him up or they were torturing him or whatever because he did have a, um, a black eye from fighting with the police when they captured him in that um, theater. And so they, to s dispel that they were doing anything to him, they, and again, this is hard to believe, they bring him out and parade him out in front of the press at like midnight or one o'clock that night. And about it is in that room, in the back is Jack Ruby, um, who corrects somebody when they say something. And Henry Wade, who is the prosecuting attorney, is, is part of this whole thing. Um, and, and uh, you know, Henry Wade will become Roe v. Wade, if you want to talk about weird connections in our history. Um, he is the Wade in Roe v. Wade because he's a prosecutor in, in, in that case, that abortion case. Um, but, you know, the, what was going on that whole time was that Oswald was being interviewed. He wasn't talking um, about a, a number of things. He was sticking to his guns about, uh, you can't say anything like that in this case. He was sticking to what he was saying, that he was just a patsy, that he was there and so forth. It's, you know, I, I don't think he was just a patsy. I do believe he was probably involved one way or another. Um, the killing of off Officer Tippett is, is a difficult one to say that you know he did that without being involved in some way shape or form mr shiny how about the bullet that came through the front windshield that is another one that if you read all of the documentation um and look at the photographs that the fbi took that night it there wasn't a through and through hole in the front windshield based on all that stuff whether that's truthfully reported or not i can't say but if you read the actual account by the FBI and you look at the photographs they took that night, it clearly seemed to be a fragment that hit the front and broke the, it actually, when it hits the front, it pushes the window out and uh, it causes it to, you know, to, to fracture on the outside. But there was, there was no through and through hole as far as I could tell. What is Jim's theory of what happened and who was involved? Uh, my theory of what happened is that the first shot hit Kennedy in the back and, in, the back in a shallow wound and fell out the back. A, a second shot hit Conley and caused all his wounds. And a third shot, or maybe a third and fourth shot, hit Kennedy in the head. And I don't know from which direction or how. Um, uh, and beyond that, who was involved, I am not expert enough to say at this point. Well, huge thank you. This has been really fascinating, Jim. And can you just let the viewers know where they can find you and support you online? 
Yeah, so uh, go to the go to vanityfair.com and look up uh, my article uh, on this. It's just it's online, and uh, you know, go to that go to that Vanity Fair site, and you can support the Vanity Fair article. All of Jim's links are in the description box below this video, so please support his work. And a huge thank you for spending time with us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Happy, happy to meet you. Cheers. Right, we're going to bring Joby in next. Hello, my friend. How's it going? Hey there. How are you? And congratulations on the baby. That's the best. Oh, f oh thank you. It's a whole new way of living. Are you sleeping? <laughs> yeah, he's um, he's so chilled out. He, he's like he goes to bed and then he wakes up at five. and goes back to bed and doesn't wake up till nine or ten. Holy cow! That's a super baby. Isn't awesome. it? And he's eleven and a half pounds, and he's only two weeks old. <laughs> the nurse said she's never seen anything like it. Wow, that's yeah. good. Stuff. All right, so I will say a little bit about you and I'll let you add whatever you want. Pulitzer Prize winner and national security reporter for the Washington Post. Author of two books, The Red Line, Black Flags, The Rise of ISIS and the Triple Agent. And he's going to be stopping by to discuss the unraveling of Syria and what part the CIA played in removing chemical weapons. So what got you interested in this line of work, Joby? Well, uh, I've got all the wonderful topics that are um, nothing but uh, completely depressing and demoralizing. Terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and everything came together in this one story, which is Syria, which, as our uh, listeners and viewers might remember, had a, a very significant stockpile of a weapon of mass destruction. They had sarin, military grade, huge quantities of it. And suddenly it's the middle of a civil war in 2011 with uh, you know government losing control of territory, with, with known terrorist groups moving into the country to take part in the conflict. It was a recipe for absolute catastrophe. And obviously it was a catastrophe for Syrian civilians. But it was also just a really, um, you know, as a journalist, extremely interesting story with very high stakes, with lots of players, with lots of secrecy and intrigue. And in the end, a, a pretty impressive technical solution that managed to get uh, most of those chemicals out of the country in the middle of a civil war, which is the, the amazing part. Where did all those weapons come from? Did we sell them to them? <laughs> you know, for once we didn't. Uh, it, you know, some of our, our listeners might, might remember that uh, uh, the U.S. government helped other countries with various programs. Uh, there, uh, the Saddam Hussein got some technical help and some chemicals from Western Europe. Um, in this case, uh, this was a homegrown program. And we know this because uh, the, the CIA actually cultivated a spy who worked in this complex, one of the senior scientists. We operated him for years. And one of the things we found out is that Syria had developed some pretty good sarin and they actually shared a sample with us. We let, they let us see what they had made and it was pretty impressive. It got uh, shared with, uh, with one of the CIA operators, operatives in a, in a restaurant in downtown Damascus and it was brought back to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to Langley to be tested. Okay, and thousands of war crimes have been committed by different sides in Syria's civil war. Civilians are being brutally killed in lots of ways. Why does this one attack deserve special attention? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Absolutely, there have been, you know, different accounting of how many people died in Syria. It's 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 a huge number. There are millions of people who remain uh, displaced, either in refugee camps or internally displaced. So there are atrocities galore. Everything from uh, you know barrel bombings on residential buildings to attacks on hospitals uh, where where people were being treated, essentially targeting hospitals. Uh, so there's just, you know, take your pick of, of just terrible things that have happened in Syria. What was different about this one attack, and particularly this one that happened 10 years ago, just last month, 10 years ago in, in 2013, uh, a chemical weapon was used in a, in a massive way. Uh, rockets uh, containing sarin, one of the most deadly substances ever invented by people, land on residential neighborhoods. Sarin is heavier than air, so it, it seeps down into basement bomb shelters and places where for families have, have, have sought shelter overnight from, from martyr, uh, mortar and artillery attacks. And when uh, the smoke clears, we, we, uh, we see an atrocity. Something like 1,400 people were killed. More than half of them are women and children. And it's the worst chemical weapons attack on civilians, possibly in all times, mm -hmm. Uh, at least since the 1980s, uh, when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons to gas Kurds in the northern part of this country. So there's been nothing really like it, um, it for decades. And, and there's been no accountability, which is the reason we continue to talk about it even now, 10 years later, because no one's gone to trial. No one has ever been charged. No fact-finding body has ever come around to kind of put together the evidence 
and and uh, deliver an indictment to the uh, to the people that did it. So that's why it remains relevant, at least for for all of us to talk about. So, what what do you suppose was the motive to release these chemical weapons? Yeah, it's, it was very curious, and the timing uh, particularly was curious because just. A couple of years before this, uh, or you, just over a year before this, the president of the United States, Barack Obama at the time, had warned Syria, don't use your chemical weapons. Don't give them to anyone else. Don't use them on anyone. And if you do, this is going to be a red line for us. There are going to be serious consequences. And so there was this disbelief that uh, the Syrian leadership would, would carry out such a provocative attack so close to the capital and in, in presence uh, or you know, near TV cameras where the whole world could witness the thing. And we you know, took some time, particularly in my book, to, to try to figure out what the motivation was. And it seems to be in part a, a huge uh, miscalculation by the Syrian regime. They had begun using little bits of chemical weapons. They had huge stockpiles. They planned to use them against Israel in a future war. But when it came to Syrians fighting Syrians, the Assad regime, out of desperation, began using a little bit of sarin here, a little bit of chlorine and an attack over here. And then in this one moment in August of 2013, when the Syrian regime was trying to clear out opposition-held neighborhoods near the capital, they decided to use chemical weapons. And since they didn't have a lot of experience with them, they completely overdid it in the sense of using much more chemicals of a much higher concentration in you know, multiple rocket attacks in two parts of, of, of the suburbs of Damascus, all of it adding to you know, mass death, mass, mass casualties. And immediately, um, just the evidence that has come in since then, the Syrians knew they screwed up. There were intercepted phone calls between military officials in Syria saying, wow, you know, this is, this is going to get us in a lot of trouble. And it certainly did. The whole world, including Syria's best allies, Russia, uh, came down on them and, and essentially forced Syria to, to agree to give up its weapons once and for all. So it, it was a, if it was a mistake, then who were they supposedly targeting yeah, so the, 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 the obvious targets for these weapons were these uh, opposition-held um, neighborhoods in, in the suburbs. Around the outskirts of, of Damascus, you have the inner city, which is controlled by the regime. And then there's this belt of suburbs called Ghouta, which, which uh, essentially was once a farming area with orchards. It became a very densely populated suburb. And it was essentially rebel held. The, uh, the, so the opposition forces at the time controlled all those, those areas. And they were creating a real you know, menace for, for people in the capital, for the Assad family and for the regime. You'd have a, mortar attacks during the middle of the day, hitting government facilities and landing on hotels where tourists stayed or stayed in the old days. And so there was a concerted effort by the regime in 2013 to try to finally push those, those rebels out. And so they targeted the neighborhoods where these rebels were concentrated. And this tactic of using chemical weapons became, for the regime, a terror tactic. It's, uh, it's not just about killing people, but it's about scaring them, terrorizing them, driving them out of their, their neighborhoods. And that worked in other places. The problem is, uh, I don't think they calculated on so many people getting killed and most of them being women and children. And then all of it being documented by TV cameras when, when the sun came up the next day. So we're talking to Joby Warwick. If anyone's got any questions, put them in the chat wherever you are watching this in the world. And we've had one question came in from Jason. He's wondering uh, whether this could possibly have been a false flag operation. Hmm. Yeah, that question has come up a lot. And, and to be honest, the people who were on the ground investigating this attack in the very early hours happened to be UN officials in Damascus when the attack took place, so close to the attack itself that they could actually see the contrails of of rockets hitting some of these suburbs. And so they were skeptical at first that, you know, why, why, would, this, uh, why would the regime do this? Maybe some opposition group is trying to, to um, you know, push the United States into joining the conflict. And then this, what we came down to, to, just to concluding in our investigation was that, you know, there, there's no evidence pointing to opposition having these chemicals at all. Sarin is extremely hard to make, it's extremely difficult to handle. In fact, we recently learned that some of the Syrian soldiers who were trying to load and mix these chemicals prior to using them were killed during this, this effort to try to get ready for the attack. We, we know they had, because Syrians have admitted themselves, hundreds of tons of sarin. We know exactly what the sarin was because we've gotten samples of it before the attack and after. So we, we've seen the chemical signatures, so we know the precise product they were using. 
And that was what was used in, in this, this suburb this, this day. So they, it was, the weapons were fired from regime-held areas. They were fired at opposition neighborhoods uh, using um, Soviet-designed munitions and a chemical weapon that the Syrians are known to have had by their own admission. And so that's all the evidence on one side. On the evidence on the other, there really is none. There's no, nothing has, 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 has emerged to this day that suggested that, that uh, the Syrian rebels either had the capability of making weapons like this or, or got them from somewhere else and managed to get the exact same formula that Syrians used. After a while, just the, sort of the, 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 uh, the possibilities or the, sort of the odds of any other explanation making sense just completely disappear. Question from Papa Chubby. Is it fair to say that Russian backing of Syria gave them the confidence to carry out a chemical attack? I think so in the beginning. And up until the point that, uh, that this huge attack took place, Russia didn't seem to have any serious problem uh, with, with anything that Syria was doing. Syria is an important ally to Russia. It's their only warm water naval port in the world. They were completely invested in, in the Assad regime's survival. And so pretty much anything that Assad did to, to, to survive, anything he did to, to, to make sure that he remained in power was supported by the Russians, not just diplomatically, but with weapons, with tanks, with military parts, with helicopters. Um, it's funny though, this, this one attack was, was the moment when the Russians, even the Russians said, whoa, this is too much even for us. And, and sort of came down on the Syrians and made them give up their stockpile and essentially humiliated them in front of the world and, and made them give up something that was really important to them because the, this chemical weapon stockpile was their counterpoint to, to Israeli nuclear missiles. It was the most important, most expensive um, weapon system they had. And because Russia insisted on it, they had to, to give that up. Interestingly, later on, after the, the, most of the weapons were removed, Russia reverted to form and would cover up for, for Syrian misbehavior. And we see Syria in the, in the months after the removal of the weapons uh, resort to using other things like chlorine. Uh, chlorine gas is actually the original chemical weapon used in World War I, but everybody has it. You're legally allowed to have chlorine because we use it for drinking water purification or swimming pools. And so they switch to using chlorine to bomb residential neighborhoods all around Syria. And the Russians said, fine, no problem with this. It was brought up to the United Nations multiple times. Sanctions were suggested. And every time Russia said, we have Syria's back on this, there'll be no investigation of any serious kind. And so it was essentially allowed to, they're allowed to get away with it. Jason wants to know where the evidence came from and who were the investigators? Yeah, so there's this organization that is uh, little known in the world and was, you know, especially before the chemical attacks of, of 2013, but there's this thing called the OPCW, the Organization for Prevention of Chemical Weapons. And they're a UN sort of uh, uh, chartered organization, kind of like the IAEA, which investigates nuclear facilities around the world. And their job is to make sure countries don't have chemical weapons. And in this case, they were the ones that were put in charge of of investigating what Syria had done, of, of finding the, so the, the, the existing weapon stockpiles and helping Syria eliminate them. And it's made up of, you know, experts from around the world. So these aren't Americans or Brits. Uh, they're they're uh, Germans, they're Norwegians, there's uh, you know, people from the Middle East, from Africa, technical experts who are brought together in this one agency and allowed to go to these countries to, per to perform investigations. And they are very elaborate investigations. They have scientific, uh, you know, you know, labs uh, that are dedicated for their use. When they have a, a sample of a chemical that's believed to be a chemical weapon that comes out of a place like Syria, it's their multiple labs will check the same sample to make sure they all agree. Um, you know, high precision molecular analysis. It's it's a very rigorous and very time-consuming investigation that these folks do, and. The intelligence community, the, so the countries of, of the wider world have no say in it. This is an independent agency, independent body that does their own work. And if you look at their reports and the rigor that they apply to these investigations, it's quite impressive. And people that want to dismiss uh, the, the findings of these groups because they um, you know, don't appreciate the conclusions or disagree with them, it's really, really hard to argue with the evidence they come out with. Fred is asked, is the oil in Syria yeah, there is some, but very little, unfortunately, for the Syrians, not enough to sustain the country itself. So they have some oil fields that are out in the western part of the country. 
Uh, there was some controversy after, you know, during the, the Trump administration when Trump declared that we should take over those oil wells. They should, we should, uh, they should be ours for some reason. But in fact, uh, most of them are, are operated by people in, in the eastern part of Syria, by the, the Kurdish groups and, and the Arab tribes that exist there. But it's really not much oil. And the facilities for developing it, for refining it, are fairly crude. In fact, for a long time during the war, uh, ISIS controlled this territory. You would see them try to refine oil you know, in big ditches, essentially using uh, you know, 100-year-old techniques to try to turn it into gasoline or kerosene or whatever they could use. But it's, it's as an economic factor, it's, it's really a, a non-entity in terms of, of anyone wanting to get involved with that country. So did this create a dilemma for Obama? It did. And, uh, and that's part of what we try to, to, to kind of really break down in this book. And I was lucky in that I was able to, to talk to hundreds of people at multiple levels of this entire story, including people within the administration who were figuring this out in real time in 2013. So Obama had said they painted himself in a corner by using the term red line. If chemical weapons are used, this will be a red line. If you cross it, there'll be consequences. He didn't say what consequences, but everybody assumed it meant a military strike. And then his, his red line is very flagrantly violated. There's this horrible chemical weapons attack. And he's essentially in a position where he has to respond. And everybody expects that there'll be missiles launched any time. And in fact, the, the, the Pentagon put together a strike plan. They had ships already located in the Mediterranean. Obama was pretty much ready to pull the trigger on a, on a strike. But there were two problems. One, there was this UN team, which I referred to briefly there. UN officials were in the country. And so there was this effort to try to get them out, quickly get these guys out so they can't be held, used as hostages or they can't you know, physically get in the way of, of a military strike. That took some days. By the time that was happening, the rest of the world, so that you, the German chancellor and other countries were telling Obama, don't do it yet. Don't just do a unilateral missile strike. Let's talk about this. Let's figure out a way to handle this collectively as, as a world community. And he agreed to that. And time keeps passing. And finally, he decides, uh, Obama decides that he's going to ask Congress to approve a, a military strike because he's criticized past administrations for just you know, getting involved in conflicts without congressional approval. So this time we'll go to Congress and we'll say, hey, we want to do this military strike. We want your vote of support. And, and Congress essentially laughed it out of out of the court. They, the Republicans and Democrats said, no way we're going to support another military campaign in the Middle East. So you don't have our backing for this. And Obama essentially was eventually completely stuck. He, he had declared that he was going to strike but now he really had no legitimate political uh, pathway to doing that. And so until the Russians came up with a, a proposal to eliminate serious chemical weapons stockpile, he was really screwed. And there was really, uh, it, was, it's, it was excruciating predicament for the people who were there at the time. So Joanne said, if Assad was winning, why would he use chemical weapons? Hmm. Well, this is the point of the conflict where he wasn't necessarily winning. So the, the, the conflict ebbed and flowed at various times. But in 2013, things were, were fairly dire. There were um, the, the, uh, the, the rebels held significant territory, including some major cities in, in the country, including this ring of, uh, of, of suburbs and residential areas right around the capital itself. And there was serious concern at the time that, uh, that the regime could topple. And in fact, uh, the, uh, some of the Western countries were falling over themselves, trying to figure out who the good opposition players were, who can we deal with when Assad falls, which everybody assumed was going to happen. Um, but what, hap what eventually uh, occurred was um, essentially Syria had important backing by the Russians and also by the Iranians and by the Hezbollah, which is Iranian allied militia group. And, and forces eventually uh, arrayed within Syria to, to, to prop up the Syrian regime. But by itself, in 2013, when all these events were happening, uh, Syria was not capable of sur surviving as, as, uh, as a regime as it was. And, um, and it, was, it seemed to be a foregone conclusion that the, the regime would fall and maybe Assad would seek exile or something like that. But he wasn't winning uh, in 2013 when he started taking this desperate um, this, these desperate measures of using chemical weapons against his own people. Before we look at ISIS's role in the Syrian conflict, I mean, how, how did ISIS come about? Who, who are they? Yeah. I might have seeded this was called Black Flags. It's essentially the backstory of, of where ISIS came from. And the pedigree is this is a 
terrorist group that grew out of the, the US, US invasion of Iraq in, in 2003. There were individuals, including this, uh, the key figure named Zarqawi, who was a Jordanian, kind of a thuggish uh, personality who was quite the opposite of someone like Osama bin Laden, who's learned, who you know, has university degrees. It kind of goes at this business of being a terrorist leader is almost an intellectual enterprise. Zarqawi was a thug, but he was a thug who had you know, the sense to move himself to Iraq just before the U.S. invasion and, and was able to build on the resentment uh, toward the United States to, to, to formulate a terrorist group that became known as Al Qaeda in Iraq. Al Qaeda in Iraq was effectively defeated by around 2008 or 9. Only a few remnants survived. But after the U.S. withdrew from, from Iraq, it, it reconstituted itself and gave itself a new name, the Islamic State. And that's what we know it to be today. It still exists, of course. All right. So they expanded from Iraq into which regions? So Syria was this perfect opportunity for this group because it was Iraqi based, uh, but under some pressure by the Iraqi, re by the Iraqi regime. Uh, and yet when a Syria uh, civil war breaks out right next door in Syria, you have a situation where there's ungoverned territory. There's a lot of uh, parts of Syria where the government really you know, is it's a no go zone for them. There's um, there the places of washing weapons. And uh, the Syria becomes kind of a cause for, for, for some radical groups around the world. Let's go to Syria and help liberate our, our Arab brethren from this, this tyrant. And so ISIS rolls into Syria to take advantage of this. And it becomes a perfect storm uh, in terms of, of a terrorist movement because you suddenly have tens of thousands of people immigrating to Syria to, to join this cause. And many of them end up uh, becoming part of ISIS because ISIS was the strongest, the most militarily capable. And they also had the sort of the, the religious message that resonated with a lot of people. We're gonna, we're gonna recreate the Islamic Caliphate. We're gonna do it right here, this religious empire. And so people who, who weren't necessarily uh, intending to be part of a terrorist group uh, liked that idea. They wanted to, to move to Syria to be part of it. And that's how they became so big and so powerful so quickly. So how many different factions were fighting in Syria? hundreds it's insane when you we try to break it down because almost like every little neighborhood had its armed brigade and it could be in the beginning it was literally shopkeepers and students and people like that joining different militia groups uh, toward um 20 later in 2013 and certainly by 2014 those started to fade away and you saw in their place more organized groups who were getting funding from gulf states and these were groups like uh, Al-Nusra Front, which is essentially an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, or at least was in the beginning. And then ISIS comes in the middle of that. And there are other factions like this, too. And the ones that became the ones that lasted and the ones that became, uh, you know, serious military um, efforts were the ones that were essentially run by the Islamists and the civilians. Then, the, um, you know, the civilian controlled militias started to fade away into the background. I mean, we saw this in the news when it erupted and it's faded. So how did it play out over the time that it's not been so prominent in the news? Yeah, so it has disappeared. I mean, people really, we don't read about Syria much in, in the newspapers or see it on TV. The conflict is still going on. It's essentially frozen to the extent that there's a couple of pockets of, of, of opposition um, that still exist, particularly in the north west in this town called Idlib, which is controlled by some of the militia groups uh, with Turkey's support. And then there are Kurdish groups and others that control different parts of, of the east. And um, but there's no end to the civil war. There's you know, continuing clashes that take place. And in the meantime, the, the Syrian country, the country of Syria, has has imploded. There's no viable economy there. It's become a haven for, for drug dealers, drug manufacturers, um, it's, it's a continuing, um, you know, uh, you know, magnet or draw for, for various radical groups. We're going to hear from Syria again. It's, in my opinion, there's, there's no question that there's going to be another chapter in this story and perhaps more brutal than the last one. We saw what happened in Afghanistan, a country that kind of essentially disintegrated in the same way that Syria is and, and uh, devolved into, you know, various groups of, you know, warlords controlling parts of the country. And that's what gave us uh, the Taliban and what gave us Al Qaeda. And so these lawless, um, unresolved conflicts or lawless areas tend to uh, tend to create problems uh, at some point or another. So I think it's a matter of time that we're going to have um, some experiences with Syria again. They're not going to be so pleasant.
So where are all the arms coming from to keep this going? Yeah, so on the multiple different sides, uh, on this, the Assad side, the Russians and the, and the Iranians kept Assad propped up with weapons, everything from small arms and explosives, to helicopters and tanks. So that's, that's the one side. And on the other, it was the largesse of uh, a lot of it from Gulf countries, uh, particularly the, the Qataris and Saudis, Emiratis, uh, supplied either weapons or, in some cases, just money with which to buy weapons. So the, the, the country became a wash in weapons with no shortage of arms, that's for sure. And then the CIA had this ultimately unsuccessful effort to arm some of the friendlies to kind of create uh, little enclaves within Turkey where they could uh, bring people to, to get training and get weapons and then send them back into Syria to fight Assad. And that didn't do very well because uh, as soon as some of these units crossed the border and, and, and joined the fight, often they were talked into joining some of the existing groups like uh, ISIS or, or Al Qaeda. Others just were quickly defeated or, or gave up. And so a lot of those weapons that the United States supplied ended up in, in going into the hands of, of rebel, of sort of Islamist rebel groups or just being lost or, or taken over by Assad. Is there an estimate on how many people have died to date? Hmm. I've seen various estimates. I think the closest figure is somewhere in the, in the range of a half million. It's, it's a staggering figure given that the, the country was, it's just not, was not a, a huge country to begin with. But what's even more tragic to me going forward is the fact that there are so many people that have no home to go to that are camped out in semi-permanent refugee camps all along the border in Turkey and in Jordan. Uh, kids who have really had no school, have no uh, real hope of rebuilding communities. And this is a ongoing sort of festering problem. In addition to all that, there's, there are thousands of former ISIS fighters who are in, in internment camps in, in eastern Syria, mostly run by the Kurdish forces. There's, there's no, you know, no Geneva Convention for them, no process for repatriating them or, or bringing them to justice. And so they've been sitting there in these camps for year after year. Mm. And it's, it's a problem that's, uh, that's becoming more dangerous because you're seeing kids who were born under ISIS now entering you know, a military age or, or, or an age where they could be radicalized to join these organizations. And that is happening indeed in some of these, these camps and uh, detention centers in the East. That's so sad, Joby. I really feel sorry for the kids, especially. And we've run out of time here. Do you want to tell the viewers where they can find you and support you? So my day job remains the Washington Post. So I cover uh, national security, and that's everything from uh, Middle East conflicts and terrorism to weapons proliferation. So again, all the fun topics. And uh, so I do have my three books out, and you can uh, if you you can find me on uh, on Twitter, and also I have a website. It's just Joby Warwick at uh, you know, and uh, also on on Gmail and, and WashingtonPost.com. Huge thank you for coming on, and spending time with us, and you take care, my friend. Cheers. Thank you, Sean. Good luck with the baby. Oh, thank you. Cheers. Right, we're going to bring in a friend of the channel of many years, Eric mm -hmm. Honley, who covers a slew of true crime. Shlew. Subjects. Shlew. <laughs> How's things familiar. going, my friend? All right, now, I hear you are a new father. Congratulations! Oh, thank you. We had him way today. He's only two weeks old, and he's eleven and a half pounds already. The nurse is like, "I've never seen anything like this." <laughs> Late little... delayed. He was growing inside just to make things worse. <laughs> yeah, little Hercules. He's proper strong. Oh wow! So Stephen is going to come on to join you in a minute. I'm going to go cool. and uh, burp the baby. <laughs> But let me let me let me just tell the viewers. Um, so Eric is one half of America's Untold Stories YouTube channel with Mark Grubert, which explores history and pop culture that is often unknown, obscure, or overlooked. He is also the host of Unstructured and the ep ep can I even say that eponymous <laughs> eponymous <laughs> just Eric <laughs> <laughs> YouTube it channel self named. Eric Hunley, where he interviews a wide variety of folks from body language experts to YouTube lawyers to folks in free letter agencies. And I urge people to go over to Eric's channel, subscribe and support his fascinating work. And I'm going to sign off and let Stephen take over. Cheers, Eric. Hey, thank you. Good seeing you, man. You too. Cheers. Hey, Eric. Good to see you. How are you doing? All right. How are you doing, man? Yeah, good. Glad you're back.
<laughs> Lot, lots to talk about. Uh, allegedly. No. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. It's always a good word, isn't it? I mean, there's uh, there's a lot to talk about in regards to JFK, and it seems to be the, the, the story in conspiracy theory circles that just will not go away. It seems mm -hmm. to gain more and more momentum, and obviously this latest story has really played into that. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about who Paul Landis is, for those who don't know. Uh, Paul Landis is on the detail in 1963, November 22nd. He had just transferred over from not long before. He kind of was the babysitter, Secret Service guy. Not to, not necessarily a bad job, but he took care of the kids. I think he took care of Eisenhower's kids before that, in the presidency before. He got promoted to be part of um, Jack, um, Jackie Kennedy's team, along with Clint Hill. So he and Clint Hill were Jackie's agents. And then other agents were with JFK. He was on the car that day, along with Clint Hill. Um, I think Clint Hill actually was behind. I, I, I don't remember the, the layout. But anyway, they were all there that day. Famously, Clint Hill is the one who dove over the hood and covered Jackie Kennedy when the assassination happened. And the new claim is that he, in fact, is the one who happened to see the magic bullet, it's referred to as. It's a, a piece of evidence called uh, 399. It's a bullet. If you ever look at it, it looks almost fully intact, um, mm -hmm. you know, pristine condition. Uh, let me see here. I can actually share that if you wanted to bring it up. I don't know if you have control. But that bullet has been controversial for a long time because this bullet looks like it was fired into a tank. You know, a standard ballistics tank, when the police are testing, they'll take a, a gun, fire the bullet into a water tank. The bullet's not messed up, really. Well, I, I, I appreciate you brought that up. Uh, I, I'll leave it to our wonderful producer, Ash, to decide whether he can no bring that in, because I'm not to be trusted with these toys, <laughs> basically. Um, for sure, but I mean, the, I, the reason being that that bullet is so pristine uh, it seems kind of unlikely to many people doesn't it that mm -hmm. that could be in that form after something so emphatic had happened and i don't know how much you know about ballistics and things like that but how common is it to find a bullet that's been used in in, in a murder or been shot in that condition at the scene of a crime extraordinarily rare i mean right. it, it, especially when it supposedly goes through two people in multiple points and then winds up oh it's fine it's sitting there that you know there's bone there's tissue there, there there's a lot involved and he, his claim is that he picked up the bullet uh, off the back there's a part where the back seat is connected to the convertible air area you know where it goes up in the car so just behind the back seat yeah see this is the bullet i mean does that look like a a bullet that has been through the ringer. You've probably seen crime shows, things like that. And most bullets look like squished mushrooms yeah. when you're done, or they're in fragments. And this supposedly is the one that went through Connolly, went through Kennedy, and that's always been a problem because it just miraculously showed up on not Kennedy's stretcher, but Connolly's stretcher. So that's another problem. How did it go from Kennedy's stretcher to Connolly's stretcher? Oh, maybe they just rolled off. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, what makes Paul Landis's account that's just been reported, it, you know, worthy of our attention is the fact that he was right there in the thick of it. He's a key player uh, in many ways that various other people who are pining on this or have theories aren't. Now, to me, just giving it the basic sniff test, what I appear to be looking at is a man in his late 80s uh, who's not mentioned this publicly or on record anywhere in mm -hmm. six decades since Kennedy was shot, which all of a sudden immediately throws up a few red flags in terms of his credibility, his memory, uh, et cetera. What, what's your perception of his claims? I, I think they're dubious. And the main reason is the guy who's going around with him um, James Robinault, you may be familiar with him. I think he might have been on a show, um, the Sean Atwood show earlier. I don't know. But he kind of came out of nowhere and made these claims. I think it was in Vanity Fair that nobody has considered the possibility that a Secret Service agent might have picked up the bullet intact and set it on a stretcher. 
except for I have a recording I could play right now of a neighbor of Sam Kenny, a Secret Service agent, who literally, oh, let me just play it. But then he told me something. It kind of is going to close the case on a 50-year-old mystery where the bullet C E399 came from and how it got there. That's the bullet was on, found on the stretcher at uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital. And Sam had found this while cleaning up the car and going through the presidential car. And he just picked it up and laid it on that stretcher. Never said a word. And then we got all done, you know. He says, uh, you, you can tell this stuff. And I said, okay, I'll tell it. If you want it out there, I'll tell it. He says, but I think you better wait until I die. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, I hope it isn't any time soon. I thought the 50th anniversary was a good time to, to tell this because he wanted it told. There you go. So you tell me. Same story, different agent, 50th anniversary instead of 60th anniversary. There's more that we cover in our episode, and it gets pretty deep into a lot of the players, but um, I think that right there should throw a little water on the story. The problem we have now, Eric, is you've just cracked the whole thing within six minutes of our conversation. <laughs> so I suppose, like, you know, seen any good movies? I, I don't know, man, you know. <laughs> Well, something I read interesting, that I thought was interesting, the BBC reporting on this, and it's something I've heard numerous times before, but a lot of people will point the finger at the JFK assassination and say that mm. that's what really began the big American distrust in government. I mean, what mm -hmm. what's your perception of that claim? Absolutely. And by the way, you, you say conspiracy theory, right? The uh, term... Yes. The term conspiracy theory was created by the CIA to attack Mark Lane, who was writing about the JFK assassination. Is that true? Because I, yes. I have heard this. and I can, um, seen... I can come up with a memo if you want. Didn't <laughs> didn't Snopes do a deep dive on this or something and, and said, actually, it's... Snopes, Snopes, yeah. really? Snopes, really? Like, you, you could do a deep dive on Snopes. And I, I, I don't <laughs> want to go into... Um, I don't know what is it you when you who deep dives the deep person. divers. That's the problem we've got, isn't well, it? Like, yeah, who who fact checks the fact checkers? But there are there are some real problems with Snopes. Yeah, and if you go through a lot of fact checks, I, I know you're a critical thinking guy, right? How many times have you read a fact check, and as you read down the fact check, you get to fourth paragraph, you're like, wait a minute, they're saying mixed, and this literally right here is agreeing with the original premise, or it says false, and then they agree with the uh, original premise. Uh, a good example is. Um, such and such was said uh, to fill in the blank, and they'll say, this is false. That was never said on Saturday. It was on Sunday. And yeah. that'll be in the fourth paragraph. So a lot, there, there is a case, and I agree with it, just because there are conspiracy theories doesn't mean everything's a conspiracy theory. There are I do think there is, like, oh, so where I am on conspiracy theories, I think, obviously, people do attempt to carry out conspiracies and injustices and, and try and get away with all sorts of nebulous things, large and small. Um, however, I also think it's a way of thinking. I think a lot of time people uh, fail to initiate a sort of Occam's razor approach mm -hmm. to things and think there must be four or five levels to something when on the face of it, life isn't often that complicated. So, I mean, wh where are you on, on JFK? I mean, I, I tend to accept the Warren report. Um, I'm open to details being off, obviously. Uh, but this idea that maybe yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't behind it or he was some sort of patsy or he was a secondary or third shooter, wh where mm. do you fall on the details? Oh, I'm completely on the opposite end of that. So other ones, we probably agree. Like uh, James Earl Ray, he shot Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. Totally believe it. Now, another one you and I probably go at, at each other on, I don't know, is uh, I believe RFK was not assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan. That's another conversation. He did shoot other people that were in the room, including the person who led his way to probation. Now, the JFK thing, this is a hard one. I mean, I've got an entire series going with my partner who is far deeper into it than I know. He's written with Oliver Stone, but the facts on that case are so overwhelmingly problematic. It's not just inconsistencies or, um, I, I forgot what uh, Michael Schirmer said, but, you know, chasing 
little de- things that are wrong. God, God it, I, would have, I would have thought Michael Shermer would have probably have said something like God of the gaps. Um, it, it wasn't that, but he was something else he said, whatever. But the, the information is so voluminous that it's like, okay, well, you got to read 200 books to even catch up with everything that's going on. There's so many characters, so many players, so much going on. But just little things that throw things off. Like, uh, how is it they found Lee Harvey Oswald's wallet on the scene, but then they also got his wallet in person when they arrested him? And over and over. Those are big problems. Like, if you were going to be doing a criminal case right now, these are giant holes. How did he get from Tippett to the theater, to you know, from the uh, school book depository to Tippett to the theater in a faster time than Roger Bannister can run it? <laughs> That's hard to, you know, I mean, it's really difficult to do it. And they go over with witnesses that they intimidate and they say, oh, Lee Harvey Oswald was here. He was here. He was here, right? All the way to the point of actually torturing a, a worker in Mexico. This has all been released in the doc, you know, the assassination documents. And it goes on and on and on. And it, it's actually kind of exhausting to go through every consistent or inconsistency. It's, isn't it a, a possible, just to play devil's advocate here and sure. really annoy the comment section? I mean, could it possibly be a, a, a product of, say, the time? Now everything's digitized. You know, you can't walk a meter, especially mm-hmm. in the UK, without uh, triggering some sort of CCTV. You know, everyone's got a smartphone. Back then, there was this really traumatic, massive event mm-hmm. unfolding. And I, I imagine recollections won't be what they could be in that state. There's a lot of post hoc reasoning, maybe trying to piece things together after the fact. Yeah, you have a film. Maybe the timeline got mixed up and this is what a lot of the conspiracies come out of, just general human error. I guess, but you do have things like the Zapruder film. An actual film of the incident, very helpful. Not only that film, but several other films. And that can be analyzed. Now, I, I would argue that there are people who are overanalyzing it, and this is where it gets difficult. Because there is nuance in there. I'm not saying, oh, it's this, it's this, it's this. There are some theories out there that are completely, we think, beyond the pale. Like that the Secret Service driver really turned around and shot. We don't believe that. We don't believe in any of that. Um, We believe that there were multiple shooters. And by the way, this silver uh, magic bullet thing just leads credence to that. And we're arguing that they're, they're pushing... They're moving the goalpost. It used to be Oswald did it. He was alone. There was nobody else, nothing else, nothing else was going on, period. Now they're saying Oswald was part of a conspiracy. So you see the shifting of the narrative here? It's a very important consideration. Why? Why wasn't it just him? And and you mentioned the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission was in the 60s, right? There was a later commission, the um, House Commission of the Assassinations. I, I forgot the full name. And that was in 78. And they determined that, in fact, there was a conspiracy to, cons- to kill the president. This is not conspiracy theorists. This is actually Congress. This is a governmental decision, kind of like Operation Paperclip. That was a conspiracy theory, right? Well, no, it's true. The documents came forth. It's been through that. It's been through Congress. It's been through the House. I mean, <laughs> I cannot get more expressive than to say these are facts on the ground that have actually been vetted through testimony and things like that in congress yeah i, I mean obviously like i say I, I i fully accept shenanigans uh for sure i mean let, you brought up this zapruder film moments ago mm-hmm. and that, that's fascinating to me and that's 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 something uh strangely and morbidly i've watched more times than i'd, I'd care to admit uh and i think a lot of what people presume could be a secondary shooter as well is the fact that if you don't really know much about exit wounds and, and things like that, it, it just looked to the layman and it certainly looked to me when I first watched it that he was shot from the front. Um, he was. And that's so that you think he was shot from the front because that again, mm-hmm. I think that that contradicts the Warren Commission, doesn't of it? Of course it does, yes. And, and and by the way, I don't know if you get to the States, Stephen, I hope you do, I really do. Go to Dealey Plaza. Physically being on site, it's startling because the picket fence area, you know, the grassy knoll, on the top of that is a picket fence. There's a mark on the road that shows the trajectory of the car and the shot that would have come from that spot. I was in the army. It's a chip shot. It is literally like less than 50 meters. 
the easiest shot that we could do in qualifying in the Army for shooting. No scope this, needed, just boom. So compare this to, say, the, the window of the Texas book suppository then, and that's presumably a much more difficult shot to make. Yes, that's, that's a difficult one, but we think that that was the, the kill shot. We think their first shot was actually from the overpass, which is a very difficult shot if you're standing up there looking. And that went through the windshield, which, by the way, has been proven. You, the windshield, the, there's pictures of the hole. There's testimony from multiple people, nurses, everybody else. That went through the windshield into his neck. So that was the first shot, or throat, sorry. Um, then you have from overhead, and we're, we're thinking it actually is not from the window of the sixth floor, but from the roof of the school book depository. And that would explain the angle, because remember, it went through Connolly's back, very high up, and then his leg. How do you, how do you, that's a, a shot going like this. That's a pretty sharp angle. Six floors, a little bit closer to this. So, you know, if you go, there's a shot, he's ducking from above, it, things line up. So a lot of this is not just, oh, I don't like the way things go out. It's how, how is it possible that a shot would go the other way? You have testimony at the time. Um, one thing we were talking about, uh, Paul, Landis, when he first testified, and this is very interesting, he stated that the shots were from the front. There's definitely shots from the front, but guess where he didn't testify? He said that in a statement, but guess who never asked him to testify? Go on. Your favorite Warren Commission. Why would you, as a Warren Commission, the ultimate fact finders, why would you spend hours talking to somebody, arguing with them about how they eat a chicken sandwich and have his bones in it, but you're not going to have a Secret Service agent on the scene, an actual eyewitness in the cars. Mm, there the ain't no that. Snopes. They ain't no Snopes, that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot going on there. And I suppose uh, it, it, it's the, the sort of multiple shooter theory. Is that also known as the triangulation theory or am I mixing things up here? Um, I, I don't know every uh, theory name. It, it could be. I mean, um, Roger Stone described it as a turkey shoot. Or actually, he didn't. He took it from somebody else. But, you know, there's like a turkey shoot and, yeah, triangulation. There's multiple shooters, different places. Darren, did I just say book suppository instead of depository? Is that what I might have here? said it, actually, which is very funny. I, I have struggled with that. Okay. <laughs> Let's just clear that up. Book um, depository. Anal knowledge is a good thing. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, Darren. Appreciate your input uh, there for sure. Okay, so I mean, let's look at it in terms of uh, multiple shooters. Then, I mean, in, in your mind, what's the likely scenario here that they, they were all? I mean, they were in cahoots with Lee Harvey Oswald because he he doesn't didn't seem to have anything to lose by openly announcing collaborators and, and things like that. And he seems to have maintained his innocence up until well, the end. We actually don't think he did it. We think that he was being set up to do it. And, and, and the reason is, and part of the problem that this goes so deep is there were lookalikes of Oswald in Tampa and Chicago, and there are plots in Tampa, Chicago, and actually Miami as well. And you look at these people, they look kind of similar to him. There are things that are tied to him. And there's other factors too, like the guy, you know that he was in Minsk, right? Or Minsk? Yes. Okay. Everything about this guy's story, one, he was 24 years old, and he led more in his life in 24 years than I've ever seen. He was OCI, or ONI, sorry, Office of Naval Intelligence. So he's definitely tied in with that. Now, this guy, while he was in Minsk, they were fraudulently saying he was buying Jeeps in New Orleans. There are receipts from 1958. So I don't know how he was buying Jeeps in New Orleans while he was in Minsk. And who brought that up? Hoover did in conversations with LBJ. So th there's a, a ton of problems with it. I think that he actually was working with CIA, ONI, as an agent. He seemed to be on both sides of the fence. One second, he's, uh, you know, fair play for Cuba. Next second, he's being interviewed as a Marxist. So w what is it? Is he pro-Castro? Is he against Castro? He kind of was on both sides of the issue in every which way, and he seemed to pop up in all these weird places kind of like an agent 
Yeah, I mean, he is a very strange character and there's a lot of gaps, certainly in his biography. Um, moving it back to Paul Landis here, I mean, he's he's come out with this knowledge and it, it seems to line up with yet another anniversary, which you just you've pointed out at the start mm-hmm. of the chat. I mean, what, what's in it for him really at this late stage? I, 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 I presume he hasn't got a book to flog or something like that. I mean, why? No, yeah, he does. <laughs> oh, he does. Okay. So- book deal. That's a good oh. a guy who who um, his last job is being a security guard in a museum. A quarter million dollars might be a nice thing to leave, leave to your grandkids. And uh, I mean, as you demonstrated at the start of this conversation, that that clip really is. And I want a better metaphor than a smoking gun, but I'm going to have to go with it. I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, that really does demonstrate that something like this has been proposed earlier from a different agent, and that's potentially where he's got it from himself. Yeah, I I don't know. The interesting thing is that the guy you heard talking, well, he's not around to contradict it because he happened to die earlier this year. When you say happened to die there, I uh, I detect a little something in your voice there. Is there anything you want to... No, well, everybody dies, dude. Everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> not me. I, I made a deal. Uh, so ah, we, we're good. Uh, you, you are the godless spell checker. I, I'm actually 92. You wouldn't know it. Um Okay, so this Paul Landis fella not doesn't pass the sniff test for me. I, I don't think um, there's anything to this, and it seems like that on the face of it. But once again, this this really does testify to the the fascination people have with this story. That a no, almost a nothing claim from this guy is is major headline news, just not only globally, but in, I mean in the UK, it's you know, the BBC, uh, mm. one of you know the biggest broadcasts ran with it today, Sky News, things like that. So, I mean, what what is the fascination with the JFK assassination? They've been lying it? for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, it's like, if you get lied to enough, and I mean, look what happened with the, um, the Assassination Records Act. You know, they agreed. All the records are going to be released by X date, right? This goes all the way back to like 92 with the JFK movie. Well, Biden, over the summer, did the last document dump and, and released a statement saying, yep, I'm closing it up. We've released enough. So, I mean, the argument here, the official argument from the, the U.S. government would be um, protecting secrecy, wouldn't it? National security. Uh-huh, yeah, suppose. three and generations it- later, I'm so concerned about you know, whom you're protecting. It, it, it gets to stretch credulity here a little bit. Who are you protecting? Why are you protecting? Are you are you telling me? Because the people who are researching this, Ruth Payne, who's involved, she's 92. This agent's 88. Um, the other agent I was talking about, Clint Hill, is in his 90s. Hmm. And the, these are only the, the trickle of people who are even still around. So who, who are you protecting? Why? Are you, are you confident you'll ever get this information at all? Because it seems to me the further away we get from it, uh, time-wise, uh, in the chronology, the, the less likely there's going to be some sort of revelation that might put things into better perspective? I think we'll come to some decent conclusions, but there are certain things like um, everybody bugs me, you know, bugs us about who who took the shots, who were the shooters. And we kind of push back saying, who cares? And, and, not, and not in that regard, but the shooters were tools. Same way as, you know, a gun or whatever. The question is, who ordered it? Who was behind it? And I think that that's pretty well known, that there's a few people behind it, one of whom became a president. And if you look at every assassination throughout history, just about anywhere in the world, who is usually behind it? If not the uh, strange spouse or lover, even more frequently, who is behind an assassination? Yeah, happy wife, happy life, ladies and gentlemen. Keep yeah. that keep that in mind. But maybe this is a good time just to suggest a few questions in the comments for Eric, if you've got any. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm really interested in this idea of who benefits here. So, I mean, who, who I was going to ask you, who would have benefited from, uh, you know, JFK being taken off the board at that time? Well, I don't know. One person became president. I mean, Occam's razor. If we really wanted to get very simplistic, who immediately benefited? LBJ. Now, was he 100% there? No, but he damn sure helped cover up. Damn sure was tied in with everything in Texas, helped run the state. He was so wired in in Texas, 
and tied in with everybody involved there, it's questionable. Who else is involved? Uh, let me see. The Dallas Mayor, Cabell or Cabell, I don't know how you say it. Cabal. Cabal. Do you know who his brother was? No. Deputy Director of the CIA who JFK fired. Okay. And we can go on. I'll go with another one. You like the Warren Commission, right? Now I know of it. Okay. Well, if you're going to have an independent commission that's going to investigate the death of a president, would you put on that commission the CIA director that that president fired? <laughs> Perhaps not. I'm just asking. I, I, I'm just saying. So this is this is all going on, and when you add all these together, it's like, well, they're anomalies. Oh my, good God! You know, eventually flakes of snow become a snowball well, here. Isn't this the antithesis of Occam's razor? Because you're just producing more questions, which seems to be the opposite of that. You know, I always believed in what I dubbed the ironic razor, and I'm taking <laughs> it from Elon Musk. <laughs> and, Please. And, I... <laughs> 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 ironic razor yes okay. that is whatever the outcome it'll truly be ironic i think that's fair enough uh that, that makes makes a lot of sense for sure now i mean i suppose uh, i mean being an american president is a, the, probably one of the biggest security threats on the planet and it seems amazing to me given you know the amount of guns in the country and um the political tensions and you know the the political vitriol that we we see now online we've said you know culminating sort of capital riots things like that that somebody hasn't made an attempt on on a president or even been successful and i'm just wondering how, how difficult would it be to do something like that today in a way that raises just as many questions or, or carry out a conspiracy i suppose in a roundabout way what i'm trying to ask is in this digital age where mm -hmm. there's surveillance everywhere and we're, we're all we've all got some supercomputers in our pockets basically with our cell phones would it be easier or harder for people to pull off a similar conspiracy i don't know um i think recently some cocaine miraculously appeared in the white house and nobody knows the source <laughs> right okay so <laughs> they're, they're 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 capable of protecting their interests when it serves. But you, I mean, you look at someone like Bill Clinton who couldn't even get get his jollies with uh, Monica Lewinsky without the world knowing. It seems like a, a lot of presidents well, have a she, lot of problems they can't she screwed really them all Right. I mean, there's two people involved. I mean, if he used the uh, Ben Franklin model, I guess, or if the Ben Franklin model was used, was it uh, two people can uh, keep a secret if one's dead? If one's dead, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's one of the reasons I really struggle to uh, accept conspiracies, especially on such a grand scale, because somebody's going to snitch at some point or make a mistake. So I, well, I generally have a low opinion people, of human competence. Fair enough. But look at how many people are dead, number one. And number two, the interesting thing about conspiracy, and I'd love to go in depth. We should have, have it out on my channel yeah, sometime. Definitely. Seriously. But um, I think that most conspiracies are, in fact, cover-ups. As an example, I'm a shitty employee. I'm working and you're my manager, right? And you're a branch manager and I'm stealing money left and right out of the till. You fired. It, you just admitted it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, but you're not going to press charges. Why? Because I've been doing it under your nose for six months. And your ass is going to hang out there too. Because you've helped lose thousands of dollars of the co company's money. Now, I'm just using this as an example. So you're probably going to just quietly try to say, get this sorry-ass employee out the door or somewhere else, just get him away and then cover it up because you're responsible. Now, take that at a grand scale where we have nine Secret Service agents who got completely bl you know, blitzed the night before. They were out till five in the morning and they lost their badges. Jesus. Oh, yeah. It's a fact. It, there's testimony, even in the Warren Commission. So I'm this, is just, this just plays into my together. human incompetence theory, though, surely. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. But you, you, you take that and then you take a separation of jobs and duties and things like that. I mean, people involved are running military operations. And a lot of these people were Vietnam, uh, not Vietnam, but um, World War II vets. So very hard-lined people who could accomplish a mission. Then you have another aspect. Consider this. What if they believed that a president who had a backdoor to the Soviet leader 
who was not working within his own government and ignoring every military and intelligence person about that relationship, what would they call that person when that other country is an enemy? I just want to bring a quick comment in from Melissa Davis, and it's, I, it must be true because it's all in capitals. She suggested <laughs> that JFK was not killed with a bullet. Uh, how do you handle that? I don't know why Eric. she's yelling at us. Yeah, there's no need to shout, Melissa. If you could just just calmly rephrase that for us, I'd I'd love to hear what you think he was he was killed with. That that that'd be something new, surely, wouldn't it? If it wasn't a bullet. But Eric, it's been uh, it's been great to catch up with you. Regardless you of where me. we differ, uh, you're clearly very knowledgeable, and you you take this seriously. And you are clearly a critical a critical thinker when it comes to the details. So it's much appreciated. Uh, maybe you could let everyone know uh, where they can find more of your work. I uh, just my name, um, Eric Hunley. If you want to see me interview people, I got to have you on the show sometimes, Stephen, because I think we can hash it out and have a good time. That sounds uh, great. That's just normal interviews. Whatever I interviewed uh, Jeff Shoup today, who was the head of the American Nazi party, essentially, who has converted. And, you know, he's on the other side talking about mindset and how to change minds and help people. Um, and then if you like this JFK, JFK stuff, I have only a fraction of the knowledge that my partner does. And all of the knowledge I have is from my partner's work over the years. And that's America's Untold Stories. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, man. Speak to you soon. See ya. Take care. Yep. Oh, David, welcome to the chaos. How are you? Steven, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me at this point. This is such a relief. You sound <laughs> you sound beautiful, David. This is this wow. is wonderful. What a what a what a time That's, to be alive. Uh, it's, uh, it's all, it's all lead, easy leading with the, leading with the right foot, anyways. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could tell us a little bit about your your uh, the Cold War channel. Yeah. So my name's David. I'm the host of a YouTube channel called The Cold War. Um, the, basic, the, the basic mission statement is to do a, a recount and are telling the story of the, the Cold War, which is basically the period from the end of the Second World War, sometimes a little after, sometimes a little before, it depends who you talk to, uh, up until 1989 or 1991, or there's a quite a lot of debate that goes on in terms of how long the Cold War actually lasted. Um, lots of people argue that it's still going it's on still today. Going on. <laughs> that, that's, that's a whole other podcast. I'm happy to come back on and have that argument sometime, some other time. Um, but uh, that's so we every Saturday we release a new video on a new topic, um, basically looking at um, some really big episodes, some really big incidents that happened, um, some cultural aspects from either life in the Soviet Union or cultural impacts in the United States. Um, and then other, other weeks we do pick sort of smaller topics and try to explore and dig into things that hopefully hopefully we can do a little bit of education and teach people with something that uh, uh, dispel a couple of myths, something that may not, might not have known about that period from 1945 to, to 1991. So, It's a fascinating period. It's a bit of a thorn in my backside because I'm somebody who's very skeptical of conspiracy theories and people trying to get away with things. And I reject a lot of them out of hand. And then people will bring up the CIA and all the nonsense they've tried to get away with. And I have to hold my hands up and say, yeah, you've, you've got me there. Uh, the really, the really, uh, the really did try some quite out there zany stuff. And chief amongst them were, you know, attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. So what can you tell me about that period of time in terms of the political climate and why, why they thought this was a you know potentially a, a good strategy. Um, so, the the to, bit of groundwork. I mean, um, Cuban Revolution happens in 1959. Fidel Castro overthrows um, Fulgencio Batista, the U.S.-backed dictator that had been ruling Cuba for quite a number of years, um, and the U.S., which had had massive, massive business and political interests. Um, in Cuba since the, at least the, since at least the Spanish-American War um, at the turn of the century. Um, the U.S. took that rather personally. Um, there was a lot of, and that's putting it mildly, um, there was a lot of senior, very influential American politicians and businessmen that lost an awful lot of money um, as the, the, when the Cuban Revolution happened. There was like scores of nationalization of the sugar industry, um, of shipping telephones, uh, you name it across Cuba. It was basically this slow process of nationalization and throwing the U.S. out of Cuba. Um, and when all of this started, 
uh, Washington basically took a very took this very personally. Um, the, the Dulles brothers, um, Alan and uh, John Foster Dulles, uh, who were head of State Department and head of CIA, um, where who had business interests through United Fruit and whatnot, um, and lots of their their buddies um, and those around them took it took a very great interest in hopefully being able to remove Castro, who they saw as being an unfriendly uh, an unfriendly item uh, to the uh, the U.S. Um, and wanted to remove him from power. Um, Unfriendly and, item. I like that. I'm I'm taking that, David. I'm going to use that in my day tomorrow at some point. The uh, the, the first one. Idea. The first one's free, Stephen. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so what what ended up happening is even under the Eisenhower administration. So before Kennedy took uh, before Kennedy won the election um, and took power. Um, the Eisenhower administration was already working on plans to see what they could do to, if not remove Castro, um, certainly discredit him um, in the minds of Cubans so that the Americans could get back in. And this very much stems from this idea that the CIA was, and they, this is the CIA is the, the group that they turned to because the CIA had a, a, a decade long history at this point of international regime change. Um, regime change is, a, I think that's more of a, a common word that we use in the, the here and now, as opposed to uh, in the 50s. Um, but 1949, as early as 1948, 1949, the CIA in its very earliest form after it was created, um, was attempting to overthrow government in Albania um, to no success. Um, they had um, success working with the Brits to overthrow um, uh, the Iranian uh, democratically elected Iranian president Mossadegh um, in Iran. Um, 1954, uh, the uh, Guatemalan, um, there was a Guatemalan coup that was backed by the CIA. And it's really the Guatemalan coup that uh, that sort of sparks the CIA's hubris, I would say, um, in terms of thinking that it could basically do whatever it wanted, especially in its own backyard. This wasn't this wasn't Vietnam where they'd helped to install No Dinh Diem. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't Iran. This was, this was 90, 90 miles off the coast of Key West. Like this is really is like literally their backyard. Um, and it sparked all these different ideas that resulted in claims of, claims from the Cubans, mind you, but claims of uh, over 600 different assassination attempts on the life of Fidel Castro um, over his life. Not all of those are by the CIA, naturally. There was a lot of people who may have wanted Castro dead. Um, but the CIA certainly had their hand in more than a few of those. So there's, your, there's a bit of background anyways. Yeah, that's great. And there's, there's lots that I want to unpick from there. But you said something interesting there, this idea of regime change and how, you know, Western powers would often try and, you know, enforce and info, enforce these kind of things. But in a sort of post-Iraq climate now, is, is the USA and the CIA lost all appetite for that kind of thing, uh, certainly in such a direct way? Sorry, David, I'm having sound problems on my side now. There's the Can you con hear me? not not that I want to get into this is getting completely on my side. There's uh the condo block that I live in hasn't had any yard maintenance in a month and they're deciding to use the leaf blower today. So uh, <laughs> my apologies. This is uh, because you you've started again. This is because you've started talking crap about the CIA and they've just I, it must be they're, they're, they're uh, listening, they're everywhere. So in all fairness, I, I I imagine it must be irritating for you being there, but we we can't really hear it so much so it's not ruining the audio um, are well, so good. I'm, can, I'm, I'm glad that you're not able to hear it um it's, if you can persevere we'd be very absolutely. grateful absolutely if you could just ask the question again i'll do my best to uh to, to press on through it seems to be Certainly. the afternoon of this <laughs> um so i think i asked uh, in terms of regime change in a, in a sort of post iraq climate does the cia in america have very little appetite for that kind of thing going forward now um i I will probably beg ignorance on the, the current state of that. Um, I'm, I consider myself to be a historian. I, I like to work with sort of the, the documents and the things that there's, there's proof of. Do I think that the CIA involves themselves in things in regime change to these days? I, I think that they're, they're a part of that. They're part of America's security apparatus. They're part, like, you know, in terms of promoting their own interests. Um, but I, what they're doing now, I don't want to, for fear that they might show up at my door or something, that's, uh, um, I would I would not feel comfortable supposing to comfortably, definitively stating that yes, they're absolutely out there causing havoc across the uh, the world and you know replacing uh, governments. Um, but there's really certainly historically the speaking, there's a long, long history um, to indicate that 
why would anything be different now? So, yeah. Okay. I mean, that really would ruin the show tonight. We've had audio problems, video problems. And if you was to be assassinated live on feed, I think that would, <laughs> think that would ruin, that would ruin my day, David. Think of the ratings with... though. <laughs> this is true. Okay. I mean, tell me a little bit about the Cold War period in, in terms of why it fascinates you so much. Of all the periods of time people like to focus on historically, why why is this one uh, so important to you? Cold War, I, I was born in the late 70s. Um, I grew up through the 80s. I mean, that's the, that, that's the period. The, the, what we now can refer to as the late Cold War, because um, we know that it ended in 1989, 1991, whatever you want to call that. Um, but at the time, like, you know, as a kid, like it was, you know, you wake up every morning knowing that the alarms could go, like, you know, you could get the, I mean, four minute warning if you were in the, uh, if you were in the UK or like, you know, 15 minute warning, if you were in North America, that the cold war could spark off at any time. That was just, that was the environment. And that was the, the life that everybody lived. And it was that you automatically lived under, and there wasn't going to be a change to that. It wasn't. I compare it to something like the Second World War, which has this sort of this fixed notion. Even during the Second World War, people knew that there was going to be an end to it. In the 80s, the Cold War seemed this indefinite. It was never going to end. And that, yeah. looking back on it, that fascinates me. Um, I played a lot of video games. I read Tom Clancy books. And a lot of those things used the Cold War as a, like a historical backdrop. And you sort of absorb all that into your becomes a part of part of who you are and what you're interested in that sort of has carried forward and why part of the reason that we do the channel um i coming back to cuba i've i've been to to cuba several i'm a canadian um we don't have travel restrictions in terms of you know direct flights i can it's cheaper for me to go to cuba for a week than it is for me to fly to london um believe it or not that's just the way that these things probably work. cheaper for me to fly to cuba than get the train to london <laughs> from where I am, and that's and, not necessarily a joke. And it'll probably be on time, no less. So yes, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, so I've been to Cuba a few times. I've been to, I've been to Santiago de Cuba, which is where Fidel is buried. Um, I did a tour of the city, and without even knowing it, we ended up at a cemetery. And you're walking through and following the tour, and there's Fidel's grave right there. Um, so it's it's all these little things in my life that sort of seem to come back around and sort of indicate that yeah, this is. There's this recurring theme in my life that I find Cold War places find me. I find Cold War places. I don't know exactly how that uh, that works out. Um, it's also, in my opinion, it's a rather underserviced period of history um, in terms of education and knowledge that's out there. There's a lot of myths. There's a lot of um, half truths that are out there. A lot of that has to do with access to sources because so much of that is classified um, or redacted to such a degree that it really is hard to know what the truth is. Um, like yourself, I'm not one that's prone to conspiracy, um, but I can, I can understand why it can happen because you do a, uh, a FOIA act like request and you get your freedom of information papers and half of it has been marked out and it's, you can't read it and your brain starts to fill in gaps and you don't know what your, your brain is just filling in gaps with maybe what the truth is or maybe what you want the truth to be. And it's, it's fascinating to sort of delve into this and sort of start picking different threads and different pieces from history and sort of threading it all together. Um, so it really is like this, this amazing period of history to me. So, um, yeah. The fact well, that I, the fact that I was there at the end, like you know, sort of like you know, you watch that on television as it the Berlin Wall hap like you know is is happening. You watch the the Soviet flag being lowered over the Kremlin for the last time, and the Russian flag being raised in its place. Um, it just seems like that that was the eleven o'clock news at the time. But in retrospect, it's like wow, like we were, we were really watching history sort of unfold. So, when was the fall of the Berlin Wall? Was it eighteen uh, nine? Yeah, November tenth or November eleventh, nineteen eighty nine. I remember that I have an early memory of, I was born in 84, but I, I have a, a memory of like a children's show in the UK. And uh, this might be a false memory. I'll have to look this up later. But they were actually giving away pieces of the Berlin Wall as prizes. Yeah. That seems uh, like something far too crazy to have just imagined myself. Uh, no, I mean, that's, I completely believe that. There were hundreds and, I mean, hundreds of tons of concrete that the wall was made of. It was the entire city of what was West Berlin not just the dividing part in the middle, but like obviously like all the way around um, was concrete, this like massively thick concrete wall. Um, and leave it, leave it to capitalism that within 
I would say within hours probably of the wall starting to come down, there were probably people starting to collect it um, and reselling it. Um, and some some pieces are, some people, there's lots of people have pieces all over the world and some, some people have more authentic pieces than others. That's all I can say to that. So I myself have never collected a piece of the Berlin Wall. Um, maybe I'm not trusting enough uh, to put my, my they're, they can be surprisingly expensive. Um, and I'm just not trusting enough to put down a few hundred pound to uh, to get a piece of the Berlin Wall that may or may not be authentic. So yeah, it's always a risk. It's always a risk. Okay, you said something interesting there. I mean, you said that, you know the, this living in this um, climate of the looming four minute warning and how how real the threat of of nukes were at that time. And nukes are a, a, a co- sort of part of the current cultural zeitgeist to game with Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, which chronicles yep. obviously the Trinity test and the Hiroshima bombing, which unless I've missed something dramatically was the last time a nuke was actually detonated. And I often wonder, given, you know, the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, how many there are, it almost feels like a sort of Chekhov's gun situation where you feel it's not a matter of if, but when, even um, just by accident. Uh, I mean, do you, do you think, um, I mean, ha- tensions rise all the time. You know, we currently parts of the world are, are at war right now. Nuclear superpowers are, you know, aggressive saber rattlers, etc. How, how likely do you think it'll be that we will see the detonation of a nuke uh, in like foreseeable future? Just a nice cheery, cheery question for you to run out there. Oh, that's yeah. No, that's um, yeah. It's, uh, if I, I should put a drink. I should put something a little stiffer in this than just a cup of tea. <laughs> but. Uh, um, I, it is absolutely no no small miracle um, that we are all standing here now in 2023, and there has never been a a nuclear a nuclear accident that has resulted in an actual detonation. I mean, we've had Fukushima Daiichi, we've had Chernobyl, obviously is the big one. There's there's numerous other um, nuclear disasters that have happened around the world. Um, those are really the, sort of the, the big ones. I mean, I think Sellafield, um, Three Mile Island, there's, a, there's several around the world that are on this sliding scale. Um, but in, it's, a, it's a very small miracle. Um, there's numerous incidents uh, that happened in the U.S. Certainly that we, there's 36 what's called broken arrows um, that happened in the U.S. where the, there was a I can't think of the exact wording that the Department of Defense uses, but it's the uh, the unscheduled release of a nuclear weapon. <laughs> oh um, my god! <laughs> and one of the, one of the more one of the more famous ones, and sort of the one that always springs to mind if I get this kind of question, was uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, the I can't remember what type of um, bomb it was. I think it was a four megaton uh, bomb that was jettisoned from a crashing B-52 that had had an air-to-air refueling accident. Um, and there's four safety, there were four safety solenoids um, that were like basically live live warhead sealed pit nuclear weapon. Um, it was the, the first three safety features failed. Um, and it was a 50 cent solenoid valve um, that prevented uh, basically like a huge chunk of North Carolina from being disintegrated. Um, there's been several other nuclear incidents that have happened that are well known. Um, there was a release off the coast of Spain near Palomares um, that 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 ground is still contaminated to this day. Um, it's not a nuclear detonation, but there's plutonium dust and whatnot that gets scattered. Um, Tybee Island um, in Georgia. There's several incidents like this. Um, and it really is just a small miracle. And then that's only the training accidents. Um, then you move to what happens, like if there's somebody, one side misunderstands what's happening on the other side. Um, and somebody decides that, yeah, now's, now's the time. Um, when I say four minute warning and 15 minute warnings, um, for those who may not be aware of this, um, the four minute warning, that's how long it would take for an, IC, for an ICBM launch from the Soviet Union to obliterate the United Kingdom was four minutes, four minutes from launch to, uh, to detonation, 15 minutes um, from the USSR to the east coast of the United States, 15 and four minute warnings. But that's, that's what you would get. Reaction time on that is not very high. There's not a lot of time to sit and deliberate um, how long like each side is going to be able to respond. If the idea is that 
your side, your team A, and I'm not going to pick sides here, but if you're team A and you see that team B is launched, you only have a few minutes to decide whether you're going to launch as a counter-strike. Um, and a lot of this has been computerized, as we've just seen with the previous host. Computers mess up. I was going to use a stronger word there, but computers do, do mess up. Uh, there was an incident in 1986. So re cut me off at any point if I'm rambling. But this is this is both uh, illuminating and terrifying. So I'll, I'll let you know when I'm ready to cry. Perfect. Um, 1983. There was an incident where a Soviet um, early warning system detected a full, uh, as you know, detected a partial launch, um, and from the United States. Um, and the commander in control, uh, Stanislav Petrov, is his name. He's also been dubbed the man who saved the world. Um, Senesov Petrov uh, made the decision that there was only 200 missiles showing uh, being launched, which didn't make any sense because there were thousands of missiles. If the U.S. was going to launch a, a strike, why would they only start with 200? So he refused to, to even call it in. He refused to authorize counterstrike. Turns out it was a computer glitch. It was, I think that, I think that's the one. It was reading the 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 radar system was reading the sun rising above the horizon as a as a launch um, there was an incident there was an incident in the state at least a couple of incidents in the states one of them was somebody loaded a training tape on like a onto a uh, a live computer sim like so it was a training like a simulation tape um so suddenly i got out of nowhere it looked like a full-scale launch from the ussr against the us um and it was only somebody actually using their using their, their brains and like sort of critical thinking decided like no this doesn't make sense discovered it was a training tape there was a flock of birds at one point um it literally it is an absolute miracle that we are still standing here right now without an without some sort of an accidental detonation or launch the more i'm a big proponent of proliferate like of non-proliferation, I shouldn't say I'm. I'm a big proponent of proliferation. <laughs> Nukes for everyone. You have a nuke. Yeah, exactly. You have a nuke. Yeah. The, the only good country with, you know, the only way to stop a bad country with a nuke is a good person with a nuke. <laughs> so that's, we'll take that to its logical conclusion. Um, I'm a big, big fan and a big proponent of proliferation. The fewer countries and the fewer groups that have access to nuclear weapons, with strong safeguards in place, um, the less likely there is that there's going to be some sort of an accident, some sort of intent, whatever that happens to be. The more nukes that there are and the more groups that have them, more, the more likely that that chance increases. To answer your original question, now that I've been rambling for a few minutes, uh, statistically speaking, it will happen because that's how the law of averages works. Yeah, that, that's where I am with it, and that's terrifying. And this is this is one of those rare situations where I've actually been quite annoyed how knowledgeable the guest is because it's just not made me feel any better, David. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this idea of mutually assured destruction is one that we seem to lean on a lot, this idea that we won't nuke you because you'll only nuke us. And it's we're basically, we're basically pressing the button ourselves to be nuked if we nuke you. But, I mean, a while back, I don't know if you're familiar with the American neuroscientist and philosopher Sam Harris. He wrote a, uh, a blog post about this, about nuclear first strikes. And he, he sort of, it was, a, you know, it was... Um, a hypothetical situation, but he envisaged a situation where perhaps an Islamist regime might acquire nuclear weapons. And to somebody like them, who would get dewy-eyed with the uh, the promise of paradise, I think how he put it, the idea of mutually assured destruction wouldn't mean anything to them. As a matter of fact, they'd probably invite it. Um, is that is that something that you've thought about, something you've worried about in terms of it, it really depends on the ideology behind the people that have the nuclear weapons? It does. So much of nuclear nuclear strategic thinking um, that's that's been developed since I mean since Trinity, um, and certainly has advanced immensely as the power of the weapons has increased and as there's this nuclear stockpile has increased. Um, so much of the base assumptions is that the the groups using the groups in control were rational thinkers, um, and that that everything is predicated on the idea of of a, of rationality in terms of decision making, um, and I think Sam Harris is is bang on. As soon as, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick on Islamists because it could be, it could be, it could be religion, it could be chemical imbalance. I mean, there's there's a, a wide variety of different um, things that 
that could present. Um, but as soon as rationality is taken out of the decision-making process, um, nuclear weapons are not a rational weapon. Like that's just at their fundamental core. They are a, it's, it's a, dis, they are, they are, dis, they are fundamentally destructive, um, especially at scale. Um, the, the U S and the, I was going to say the Soviet union, cause that's where my brain sort of all, all it, my bookshelf is over here. And like every second title has something to do with the USSR. Um, both of those sides, what was I talking about? Rationality, rationality, rational thinking. So much of that is, is predicated on this idea that you want to live in like, you know, it's, it, there's a win condition because the win condition exists. And that win condition, if you've seen Dr. Strangelove, it's, oh, yeah, you know, because the, there's 20 people in a mine shaft and like, you know, because you have 20 and the other side has zero, you've won. Like, but that's as messed up as that is. That's, that's, that isn't necessarily rational thinking. Rational thinking is the idea that your culture overall, your society can, can carry forward. Nuclear weapons are all destructive. Like in, when they're used as the strategy dictates that they will be used, which is all or nothing. And that's, that's basically how war plans, flexible response, um, which is something else that we could talk about. Flexible response doesn't exist. There's always an escalation to move to, it could start with like, you know, a baby nuke on the battlefield and that's going to escalate its way up to the big boys. That's just the way that's always going to work because the military mind takes over and it's, you know, it's basically, we need to, we need to achieve that win condition. As soon as one's been used, that Pandora's box has been opened. It's not a rational weapon. It's all destructive and they, nuclear weapons will, if, if used in a, in a hostile manner, will wipe out the, the world as, as we know it. The earth will, this is, this is what I keep trying to tell my kids. The earth will survive. It's just that we won't be here with it. <laughs> Yeah, a great, great name dropping of Dr. Strange. Love that. I'd reckon if nobody's, if people haven't seen that in the chat, it's one of Kubrick's best, I think. And uh, for a satirical comedy, essentially, of that age, it, it stands up really well, strangely. It could have been written yesterday. In incredibly well. Um, I know Hat Green um, Nuclear Bunker outside Manchester, um, for those of you in the UK. Um, they do occasional uh, screenings inside the bunker of uh, of Doctor Strangelove, so I'm gonna name drop Hat Green there. I, I um, live so, in Manchester, and I think I've been on the tour. Yeah, that's check check the website. Occasionally, they they do occasional screenings of uh, Doctor Strangelove, um, which I would perversely enough, I would love to attend. That would be uh, phenomenal. So yeah, the, there are two nuclear bunkers in Manchester that I'm aware of, and one allows tours, and the other one was bought out by a, like a phone company that that uses it to now run like hundreds of miles of cable uh, around. Uh, so yeah, so, somebody did break into it once on seven seven of all days when London was oh. under attack, which is is not the day you want to be breaking into high security facilities. Uh, no, for not sure. really. No. Did you watch Oppenheimer? Did you see it? I did see Oppenheimer. Yeah. What did you think? Uh, I enjoyed it. I'm I'm not I, I, without getting into the, the, the whole my my movie opinions. I'm not the biggest Christopher Nolan fan. Oof, um, con that's the most controversial thing you've said today. Well, I could say something even more controversial. I could say that Barbie was a better movie. <laughs> Can I talk about Oppenheimer? Like, I don't want to spoil. I know. I think we should it. move on. No, I'm only kidding. Go ahead. I don't. I don't, I don't want to spoil, spoil it. it. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. <laughs> no. I, as, as a movie, I like the stories, and there's two stories that that Nolan's telling, um, and I think that he's trying to tell too much. He's hmm. got two stories running in parallel, and he hasn't managed to. He didn't manage to merge them together well enough to my personal satisfaction. I think they're. I would have preferred either a story of making the bomb or a courtroom drama. I have exactly the same. So I'm a massive Nolan fan, but I've been quite lukewarm of, 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 towards a, a lot of his later efforts. And I, I felt like, because it was building up to this big moment of the Trinity test, you know, the tension was racketed up. It was a beautiful yeah. moment. And then there was another hour of like courtroom drama-esque material and it just felt a little bit deflated i feel like he should have just gone the whole tarantino route and, and you know changed the ending and actually had the trinity test cause the uh the earth to explode that would have been quite poignant and interesting uh, it just would have been feet being incinerated at the end <laughs> yeah you know, yeah tarantino so for sure so i mean moving back to castro you, you said something like six six hundred assassination attempts yeah so that's the 
That's that's the Cuban Security Services claim. Like by the time that Castro passed away, there had been 634 separate attempts. Um, the CIA was only really ever has only ever been confirmed as being involved in about seven of them. Um, the there was a so Operation Mongoose, which I think was when when Ash had first reached out to me, it was to actually discuss Operation Mongoose, which was the coming going back to Kennedy and uh, and uh, Eisenhower. Um, that was basically it was the, the U.S. plan to to discredit and to remove Castro, um, and that very much started off as with this idea of discrediting him, like you know of discrediting Castro to the point that the Cuban people wouldn't be in love with him anymore and they would overthrow him and you know the U.S. could move back in and everything would be back to, to happiness and casinos. And we'll come back to casinos in a second because that's really, really important to the story. Um, early plans involved putting uh, like thallium salt in, in Castro's shoes, um, which thallium salts are a depilatory. They'd make his beard fall out. Um, and you know that's his, Castro's beard naturally had magic powers. Um, so as soon as he was, you know, the the, revol the Cuban revolutionaries, like the guys who had like Raul and and Cienfuegos and and um, and Fidel, those guys, they were they were colloquially known as los barbudos, which in Spanish means uh, the bearded ones. Um, and the CIA really latched onto uh, beards um, in terms of trying to like you know it's like take away Castro's allure um, and cigars. Um, they tried to provide botulum. What was it? No, it was to. No, it was botulum laced um, cigars, um, so that the cigar would uh, either make him very sick or kill him. They tried to arrange to give gift him a scuba, like a wetsuit, a diving suit, with um, that was infested with like um, fungal spores, um, that would give him like an all over body rash and make him unable to go in public. And you know, it's like deal with the people because he would be like terribly disfigured. They tried gifting him a, a scuba tank that had tuberculin uh, bacilli uh, to give him tuberculosis and kill him over the long term. Um, as these sort of plans got more and more outlandish, um, they were they had considered um, they considered uh, planting an explosive an explosive seashell um, in an area that he liked to go uh, uh, diving. Um, Castro was a, a huge aquatics guy, like he loved to go um, diving, scuba diving and uh, snorkeling. Um, but that, that was the thought that they were going to put this really attractive shell that was laden with uh, explosives. And then when Castro went to pick it up, it would explode and kill him. Um, that never actually went anywhere. Um, and then Bay of Pigs happens um, in uh, 1961 and fails spectacularly in a really, really big way. And it's a huge, huge embarrassing moment for the... Uh, um, for the United States as a whole, but especially for the CIA, because that, that was very much a CIA-backed plot. Um, and that's the part of that, that talk about uh, hubris that I was mentioning earlier, where there's this idea that, that the CIA could do anything. And whatever they, they, they attempted to do, they would obviously get success because they were American and they were the CIA. Um, and then the Bay of Pigs fails spectacularly for a very wide variety of reasons. I'm going to plug the channel. We have a really good episode on the Bay of Pigs. Please go to the Cold War channel. Check that out if you're interested. Um, but the CIA basically started changing its tactics after the Bay of P after Bay of Pigs, um, and it involved actual real wet work, um, and that involved like straight up assassination attempts. Um, and one of one of those assassination attempts involved um, trying to uh, smuggle in an actual like like a sniper rifle, um, and have a willing agent in Cuba assassin like straight up like just shoot uh, Castro dead. Um, the gun and the money and everything went on their merry way and never turned up, never to be seen again. That's the recurring theme in this. Um, but then the CIA cottons onto this idea that um, well like. Who, what other, what other interests in the world would have uh, be curious to get rid of Castro? And one of the big ones um, that they cottoned onto was the mafia, um, the, the the organized crime in the United States. And so, using a, an a, an ex FBI agent as a cutout, the CIA reached out and they were put into contact with uh, three separate men. To begin with, it was uh, Handsome Johnny Rosselli, um, who was a uh, who was a big Vegas uh, mobster. Um, Sam Giancana, who was a Chicago, head of one of the Chicago uh, families. Um, and through them, they were also put into contact with a man named Santos Traficante, 
um, who was a Spanish speaking uh, part of the mob, but also very much uh, um, uh, involved with, uh, with the mafia and with Cuba and the Cuban community um, and the exile community in, uh, in the south of Florida. And through this, they started trying to arrange various, um, various assassination plots, um, pills, and they were really big into the pills. Um, and they were trying, they had a couple of different uh, plans where they were going to try to sneak pills into a, a subversive agent that was working in one of the, ho the one of the restaurants that Castro uh, liked to visit. Um, and at each stage, something happened and it was foiled. Um, each, each of these plans that the CIA, that we know of that the CIA was directly involved with, some, some sort of chance, happenstance, um, something fell apart and it, it didn't come about. Um, and then, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis happens in October of 62. Um, and then following that, uh, Bobby Kennedy and JFK were both taking, were both taking Cuba incredibly personally, um, Bobby Kennedy especially. Um, Bobby Kennedy finds out that uh, his brother, the president, is having an affair with a woman named Judith Exner, um, who was a girlfriend of um, Sam Giancana, uh, who's the mobster. Um, and they find this out because um, Judith Exner keeps calling the White House to talk to, to the president. Um, and how that all came about is it's, it, you can't write this stuff. Like this is the truth. The truth can be stranger than fiction. Um, and it all sort of comes about that the attorney general and Bobby Kennedy knew that the CIA was illegally tapping, um, the, placing wiretaps in the United States, which they're not allowed to do. They, um, that's FBI territory. The CIA is only allowed, by law, the CIA is only allowed to operate extraterritorially outside the United States. Um, so there's all these like circuitous paths that, that, that seem to cross and come back and forth um, through the whole thing. But following Bay of Pigs, uh, sorry, not, not Bay of Pigs, following the Cuban Missile Crisis, they really start to pull back a little bit and there's some reconsiderations like, you know, what are they doing? Um, they know that the, a full scale military invasion is no longer possible because um, they've made that promise to Khrushchev um, in exchange for not blowing up the world. Seems rather important at the time. Um, and what we were just talking about. Uh, and this just sort of goes on. And then what your earlier guest was talking about, then JFK is assassinated. And as soon as JFK is assassinated and LBJ takes over as the presidency, JFK had no interest in Cuba whatsoever. He was far more interested in what was happening in Southeast Asia um, and in Vietnam. And basically within, within the space of months, um, LBJ has wrapped up all the Cuba operations um, and squashed them, like basically told the CIA no more. Um, and all the CIA stuff is pushed under the rug and it's all sort of covered up and like, you know, they close the files and walk away and they all go get involved in Southeast Asia until the church committee hearings start coming up in uh, 1975. And these are Senate, Senate here, open Senate hearings um, looking into American Security Service oversight um, and overstep, um, looking at all the places where the CIA has overstepped their mandate, done, just gotten way past what they're actually supposed to be doing. And that's when a lot of these are sat, like the, the actual proof, um, and there's legis like, not legislated, there's testimonial proof um, and documentary evidence that the CIA was involved in all of these things. Um, it's kind of a wild story. Like it's, it really is a, a bit of a roller coaster. Um, and I'm giving it really short shrift here and I do apologize. I'm just looking at the time and I think I've only got a few minutes left in terms of the, uh, the time slot, but uh, um, it really is just some really crazy, crazy stories. And some, I mean, you want to, I, I work, I have a corporate job um, and you keep hearing the corporate world loves like, you know, out of the box thinking, blue sky thinking this really was like CIA, like a bunch of like, you know, X, like these are spooks, like sitting, sitting in a room coming up with like, what's so what are some ideas that we can come up with? And it's exploding seashells. It's, you know, I mean, that, back, let's, let's talk about that, the wackiness okay. of it because if these are supposed to be the greatest minds, you know, the, the clue should be in intelligence and it's a very, it's a, you know, the assassination is a very serious business and some of the, the ideas they come up with, would it be out of place in, in say, like an Austin Powers movie or some sort of James oh. Bond spoof? Is that wacky? How how have we got into the situation? I mean, is it just the the value of hindsight because they were treading new territory, or were they were they really just completely off the chain mentally? 
the wackiness of a lot of these ideas comes from a I think a conscious awareness of the agents that were doing the involved in the planning it was a conscious awareness that the Cuban people weren't particularly interested in removing Castro. They were never going to get a popular revolution to overthrow Castro. Castro would come in and removed a hated dictator. Uh, he was introducing education and healthcare, trying to end racial discrimination. You can have a, there's an endless argument that can happen in terms of what the long-term success of all that is. But in the early 1960s, that's what he was coming in. That's what he was doing. Um, he he took a he took a, pop, a population that was had four, like a 40 percent illiteracy rate, and I think Cuba Cuban literacy rate in the present is like 99.9 percent. Um, he was a popular guy. There was never going to be a popular revolution. It didn't matter if his beard fell out. It didn't matter if he had like a bunch of fungal spores all over him. Like that that wasn't going to make a difference. Um, well, David, and I think that's that's where a lot of this. And so, like the, the wackiness idea is like, well, you're not going to get a popular revolution, which is what they had triggered in tried to trigger somewhat successfully in Guatemala. Um, it was never going to happen in Cuba. So you start thinking like, okay, well, what can we come up with? And that's where you start coming up with exploding cigars. Well, David, you you are an encyclopedia on this topic, and I think I feel I honestly feel like I've been schooled in the most interesting way in, in this conversation. I will I will check out your channel for sure because I will I will no doubt learn so much. So maybe you could just let people know where they, we can find more of your your content and output on this issue. Yeah, so it's um thank you very much, Stephen. I I really appreciate the effort that the, the opportunity to come on and um just talk for half an hour. Most most people, including my wife, told me to shut up a long time ago. So. <laughs> Um, so the channel is uh, it's on YouTube, uh, it's just The Cold War. Uh, if you type in The Cold War into the, uh, the search menu, hopefully that comes up. Um, we've been on releasing videos every Saturday for four and a half years now, I want to say. Um, so there's 250 plus uh, videos. Uh, if you do start at the beginning, um, their production quality is maybe a little rough. Some of the, the newer stuff is it's a little cleaner, it's a little, it's a little prettier. I think I'm a better host now than I certainly was then. But uh, but yeah, God, please check us out. Um, leave co I read all the comments, the, especially the bad ones. Um, but uh, oh, it's yeah, it's a hellscape. But uh, but yeah, like please come check us out. Learn a little bit about uh, Cold War history. Um, we take requests. We don't always listen, but we do take requests. So that's uh, that's us. David, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for speaking to us. I've uh, learned a lot for sure. Pleasure was all mine. I appreciate it. All the Take best. Care. Take care. I think we needed four or five hours to deal with that topic and everything David knows on it. It's, it's fascinating. I hope hope he gets to come back at some point. But I'm just going to bring in our our next guest. Uh, Sarah, welcome to Outward Unleashed. How are you? Thank you. I'm very well, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me on. It's our pleasure. I, I've read your, your wonderful book and uh, it was great for me because I, I I have to admit, I, I knew absolutely nothing about the, you know, the White Chapel murders of, you know, Jack the Ripper uh, outside of sort of popular culture tropes and things like that. So it was great to get a good deep dive. And I, I had no idea how how sort of horrific it was as well. It probably sounds a bit daft to say. Uh, so maybe we, you could just start by telling us your sort of your personal connection to this, this you know, world famous story that's become, took on almost mythological uh, trappings, hasn't it? Yes, my book One Armed Jack is a non-fiction re-examination of the Jack the Ripper case and it proposes a new prime suspect, Chaim Hyams, an East End cigar maker. And my introduction to the case came about because I discovered in early 2017 that I had a police ancestor, Harry Garrett, who worked on the case. And this just came about through family history research, which was started by my late father and which I took on after his death. And when I found Harry had been transferred into Whitechapel on promotion to sergeant in January 1888, and the Ripper murders kicked off in August of that year, I was so intrigued that I thought I would find out more about the case myself. And as you say, we all feel that we know something about the Jack the Ripper case, but in fact, it was a series of five, or in my analysis, six murders in quite a compressed time frame between August 
and November 1888. And with a lot of complexity about the victims, the circumstances of the murders, the locations. And in my book, I do a true crime reconstruction for each of the murders. And I actually follow the killer's escape route home. I think you're, uh, if I've remembered correctly from reading the book, I think you refer to the the victims that you attribute to him as sort of the, uh, the canonical victims. Uh, and I, I just wonder what, what sort of things, I mean, my first question on this would be, how difficult is it to obtain first-hand sources of events, given it's, you know, happened so long ago in a time where records aren't the most, you know, well-kept things? And how, how are we linking these uh, victims in your mind to say this is definitely the same attacker? Exactly. So we're 135 years on and the main Whitechapel murders files, the Metropolitan Police files. And over the years, they, like the City of London police files, have been bombed in the blitz, lost, weeded out, even pilfered from. And so what we have is a very incomplete set of papers, which are the original files, which I was fascinated by because I wanted to get back to my police ancestor and what was genuinely happening at Lemon Street Police Station, where he was posted. But in terms of other sources of information, the inquests into the deaths of each of the women were well reported in the newspapers. And there is a lot in the press of the day, not least because the journalists were news hounds exactly as they are today. And the police did feel that they were frustrating their inquiries by scampering around the streets of Whitechapel and speaking themselves to the witnesses and people who lived locally to the murder locations. That's interesting what you said about the sort of tenacity of the journalists. I think you mentioned in your book at one point that a potential suspect sighting may have just been a random journalist looking for information at the time as well. I mean, just moving on to like the, the chosen victims here, I mean, the, the majority of them, if not all of them, I believe, were sort of working girls, uh, prostitutes, for want of a better word. Was there any sort of feeling perhaps from the authorities that this was less um, worthy of their time because of the status of these women? There are a couple of myths that I would love to bust here, and this is one of them, because the police put their best men on the job. This is both the Metropolitan and the City of London police. The women's lives were not considered of less value because they were destitute, uh, because they were casual street walkers. Many of them had other roles. They uh, cleaned for local people. They hawked or sold small goods like needles and thread on the streets. So they resorted to casual prostitution when they were desperate. And they were often desperate because Catherine Eddowes, for example, was so poor that she carried all of her possessions in her pockets, including tins of tea leaves and so on. And her partner had pawned the boots that he was wearing to try to get them into lodgings for the night. So I think we need to look at these women in the situation and context where, where they lived, which is they fell on hard times and there was no safety net. That's very well put. I'm very happy for you to clear that up for people uh, as well. I mean, obviously, your your uh, way into this, as you said, like a sort of ancestral genealogy revelation, you know, makes perfect sense. But this isn't some obscure thing that happened. There's still a huge amount of public interest and folklore uh, surrounding it. What do you think keeps the fascination with it alive, considering, you know, on the face of it, it's extremely unpleasant and, and grisly in many ways, but the public seem to really still be fascinated with this one uh, particular individual? I think it has long been considered the world's greatest unsolved mystery. But I find this ironic because when I started researching the case with very minimal knowledge myself, although I had been on a Jack the Ripper walk 
when I first came to London uh, in my 20s and I was persuaded on it by two old school friends and it was a talk given by the great Donald Rumbelow who's one of the main ripper experts and that momentarily got me interested in the case but I was a young person in London and I thought no more about it until I made the discovery in early 2017. And regarding the case, this is another myth that needs to go out the window as far as I'm concerned, because I was astonished when I started researching it seriously to find out that the police of the day had publicly declared that they'd solved it. So CID Chief Robert Anderson said that he'd solved the case and the identity of the killer was known without doubt, but that a key eyewitness had refused to testify against a fellow Jew. And the reason for this would have been that um, it was the death penalty in those days and the killer would have either been hanged or if he'd been found to be a criminal lunatic, he would have spent the rest of his days in Broadmoor. But um, hanging was really the first um, kind of sentence and probably what would most likely have happened. And Robert Anderson and some of his fellow officers left a profile of the unnamed suspect that has provided enough information for me to feel that 135 years later I've solved the case. And Anderson described a Polish Jew, an East Ender, who lived in the immediate vicinity of the murders, who was seen by a fellow Jew who refused to testify against him who suffered from fits or paroxysms, which fit very well with Chaim Chaim's having severe epilepsy. And these fits caused him to kill. And um, he was neutralized by his admission to a lunatic asylum. And um, his colleague, Inspector Donald Swanson, who was the lead investigator in the case, gave two locations where the Ripper was held, Stepney Workhouse and Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum. Robert Anderson's wife also mentioned Stone Lunatic Asylum. And when I researched Chaim Hyams, I discovered that he had been held in each of those three locations, which are geographically dispersed. And in fact, the distance between Colney Hatch in North London and Stone in Dartford in Kent is over 30 miles, which would have been a considerable distance in the Victorian era. Yeah, I mean, that that in, that in the idea of this individual being identified as sort of a Polish Jew is mentioned in your book. And this is the first time I'd ever heard it mentioned that the, the perpetrator was potentially Jewish. And you mentioned this as a detail in your book, very matter of factly. It's not you're not disparaging the Jewish community or Jewish people or anything like that in general. But when when setting this down, were you a little bit worried how it might be interpreted by people? Obviously, you've got one of the people, uh, you know, one of the most ferocious serial killers in, in mythology. And you're saying it's a Jewish person. And, and not only that, a fellow Jew may have covered up for him. Just optically, did, would you have any pause for concern about how certain people might interpret what you were saying? Robert Anderson himself felt that he would be accused of anti-Semitism because of what he publicly published in his memoir about the case. And he said, look, this person just happens to be a Polish Jew living in Whitechapel and there's not a lot I can do about that. You know, the crimes weren't religiously motivated. Um, as I explain in my book, they were sexually motivated by someone with quite severe uh, psychological and physical illnesses. And I was just careful not to be sensationalist, not only with that, but I didn't want to in any way disparage the women who were the victims. And actually, I did feel some compassion for the killer himself. And I did try to write a very balanced account of what I believed uh, happened in those dark days of 1888. 
What What are the eyewitness testimonies like in terms of the physical description of this individual? What kind of things could we say that we know pretty well that could create a picture of, you know, if we were to draw him or do some sort of e-fit, what, what kind of distinguishing features could we could we point to? So there were several eyewitnesses across at least four of the murders. And these are people who either saw a man accosting one of the victims in the minutes before her death, or they saw someone running away. And I have some information here about what they saw. And they saw a man of medium height and build, between five foot five and five foot eight inches tall, stout and broad shouldered, age between 30 and 40, with a full face, dark or brown hair, a moustache, wearing a dark jacket or coat, trousers, sometimes a hat more like a bowler hat, occasionally a peaked or double peaked cap, which you wore to keep the rain off your neck. Um, he spoke colloquial English in a mild voice. And one witness said he had a stiff arm. And two said that he had this unusual shuffling walk with bent knees. And from what we know about Chaim Chaims, he was weighed, measured, described, and his mental and physical illnesses and disabilities were listed in his medical records. And I can say that he was aged 35, he had dark brown hair, he probably had at least a moustache and possibly also a beard at the time of the killings. We don't know this because the only existing photograph is from several years later, taken in Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum. He was five foot seven and a half inches tall, weighed 10 stone seven, and it was towards the top end of the modern uh, BMI. He was noticeably broad shouldered. He talked with a slight hesitancy of speech and he was injured in February 1888. He broke his left elbow, which left him unable to fully bend and extend his left arm. And he had an irregular gait or way of walking with asymmetric foot dragging. And this is what uh, two of the eyewitnesses saw. Um, his files say that after his periodic epileptic fits, he was extremely violent and dangerous. And this may explain the periodicity of the Ripper murders, which has been a subject of debate for many years. Um, when in good health, he was quiet, civil and attentive to his physical appearance. And his wife called him kind and industrious. But when he was in poor health, he was dangerous, treacherous. Uh, he tore his sheets. He painted the walls with excrement. He committed violent attacks on his wife when she visited him, medical staff and fellow inmates, one of them with a sharpened piece of metal to the throat, which he managed to get hold of. He was delusional, paranoid, and an alcoholic who suffered from delirium tremens, which can cause hallucinations, that severe alcohol withdrawal symptom. And he was suspected to have syphilis. And interestingly, he had a, a paranoia, which called a terror on, on the, the files, that um, the police were following him. And indeed, the City of London police said that a man was chased from Mitre Square, the scene of one of the crimes, and at a later date was put under surveillance for three months. And there's a period of three months between January and April 1889, when Haim Hyams was at liberty. And in my book, I propose that this might have been the period of time when he, Chaim Hyams was under surveillance and hence his terror of the police when uh, admitted to medical facilities. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going there and you, you detail this really, really well. 
in your book. And I was just wondering as well, given the sort of the violence involved and the ferocity and the, the damage done, what sort of weapons are we looking at that, that a person could conceal that could, he could use to cause this, uh, inflict this amount of damage on these victims? It was believed to be a knife at least uh, six inches long. And the police surgeons of the day, when they conducted the post-mortem examinations on the victims, they were asked by police what weapon could have inflicted this. The only difference is in what might arguably be the first murder of Martha Tabram, when it was thought that uh, a very deep wound uh, to her chest might have been made by a butt by bayonet and in fact she was seen consorting with a soldier however it was possibly several hours before her death and so there has been considerable debate about whether she was killed by a soldier or whether she then went on to pick up another man who was the ripper not a soldier who may actually have killed her with a normal knife well, I mean, what's interesting, when we started speaking, you, you spoke about the motive being sexual. Uh, and you mentioned in your book, you know, that a lot of these victims would have felt they were just leading a potential customer away somewhere private, perhaps. So uh, how does that, how do we get from him wanting sexual gratification and, and, and you know, going with the pretense of taking these women's services to, you know, outright butchering them? I mean, is this is this just a horrible way of you know not not paying is this is this something else going on how, how do we derive it as a sexual motive they've always believed to be been believed to be sexually motive motivated attacks and i think some of it is the victim profile some of it is the extreme violence visited upon the women so after killing them unless interrupted their killer mutilated their bodies, some to, as you say, quite a horrific extent, which we won't discuss now. And his aim and objective was to remove their wounds. So this is clearly a very sexually motivated act. And he also stabbed them on their genitals. Um, it is a way of getting gratification. So a lot of sexually motivated crimes do not involve rape. And in fact, the Ripper murders are not considered to be rapes, that he did get his gratification from posing the bodies in certain positions after their murders and by uh, through the mutilations and by the removal of some organs of their bodies as trophies. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting you mentioned in your in your book as well at the time, there was this idea of sort of an American aspect influence of somebody looking for organs for particular uh, reasons. How, how much do you feel that that theory plays into it in, in terms of its credibility? I don't believe that he was collecting organs in terms of wanting to use them for medical or pseudo-medical purposes, which was a theory that was um, proposed by one of the leading coroners of the day. However, Yes, I think it is clear that he was seeking to remove the wounds. And in other cases, he did remove a part of a kidney, a heart of another victim and so on. So um, these really are extreme crimes. And you can understand why the East End streets were became panic stricken people were terrified they would only speak of the ripper in whispers and people very quickly realized that it was not safe to go out after dark although of course if you were desperate and destitute and possibly you know had no other option you might have felt safe you know or safe enough that it was unlikely to happen to yourself does it surprise you how long this went on in terms of, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, in, in the sense of he's gay, he's, he's a slight difficulty in walking, the issue with his arm. So he, he may have not been the strongest individual or the fastest individual. And it strikes me that a lot of his crimes were so brazen in terms of their locations and the ferocity uh, as to attract a lot of attention. And he seemed to get away with this time after time uh, to the point where really 
uh, it's still considered an unsolved case. And obviously, I'd, I'd like to say that it would be almost near impossible for anything similar to happen now without them immediately being identified in court. Does it surprise you even then that this went on for so long since there were so many victims? The police of the day had so few few tools and techniques available to them. The first two murders in my analysis, so Martha Tabram and then the first of the canonical five, Polly Nichols, were unwitnessed. So nobody beyond Martha's soldier, which we've already mentioned, nobody saw them uh, consorting with a man close to the time of their death and nobody saw anyone running away. So you've got two to start off with, whereby the police had extremely little to go with. Then we have the murder of Annie Chapman. And there are two very interesting eyewitnesses. A woman called Elizabeth Long saw a man who was inevitably, must have been the Ripper, accosting her, talking to her, leaning against the shutters of a house on Hanbury Street, where Annie Chapman would minutes later be killed in the backyard. And then a man called John Thimbleby saw a man almost running from the scene of the crime along Hanbury Street and away down Brick Lane with this very peculiar gait with uh, bent knees, which is exactly the uh, physical issue that Hyam Hyams had. And I do posit in my book that as a loose supposition, it was potentially solvable from that point forward. But I don't say that with any certainty because you have these sightings and the difficulty in the overcrowded East End of trying to match these, you know, tenuous descriptions to a known individual was extremely difficult. Um, the police had more to work with after the double event in which two women were killed within 45 minutes of each other. And one of those murders took place in the square mile of the City of London, bringing the extra resources of the City of London police to play. And with that uh, second murder, we have this reluctant eyewitness. So we have a key witness who might have been able to secure a police conviction of the Ripper who refused to testify. And unfortunately, after that, the police were still unable to stop the killer from the escalation of violence that we see in the last victim, Mary Jane Kelly. Where did the name Jack come from in all this? So there were some hoax letters sent into the police. The police were inundated not only by hoax letters uh, constructed by journalists, which kind of kept the story running in the, in the quiet days between murders. Um, and one of those letters was uh, signed Jack the Ripper. But the, they were also inundated by very well-meaning members of the public coming forward saying they'd seen men with blood-stained cuffs or shirts or people behaving strangely at particular locations or making threats which sounded a bit ripperish. And so the police were absolutely inundated with um, information and they also clearly needed to conduct house-to-house -house inquiries and find a way using plainclothes policemen and surveillance of trying to track down the killer. And they did use those techniques and arguably successfully in the Jack the Ripper case. Do you think, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that this is such a historical case and we seem to think we know all we know or we, all we can know rather. And then you look into it a bit more and you, you find something else that's really interesting and fascinating and incredible on the face of it. Do you, do you think it's possible we will get the answers one day that you, you need a key piece of information, a new technique, something we can do, you know, outside the realm of time travel, I suppose. Are you optimistic that we'll, we'll learn more on this story or do you think we pretty much have everything we're ever going to have now? 
I genuinely believe that I've solved the case. Nobody else has an evidence-led hypothesis which matches the distinctive physical characteristics reported by eyewitnesses and the police and the profiles both constructed in the day and by the FBI a hundred years later in 1988. So I think I've made a strong case and I don't think a stronger case can be made. The, the only thing that I do put in my book is whether anyone will, would like to follow in my footsteps and have another look at the case that I've put and possibly add to it. But I don't think they'll be than mine. I mean, there are a lot of people now, I mean, the internet has certainly has, has enabled a lot of people to get to information. There's a lot of amateur sleuths and people who spend their time looking at so-called cold cases. And it's become quite, quite popular as a pastime. And it's got a huge audience from it. And there'll be people out there who think they know Jack the Ripper and they're the the expert and they're the, the leading voice. Have you had any sort of pushback from people who have uh, who have taken issue with your conclusions? I haven't. People seem very intrigued by me and my theory. People who've read the book have written some good reviews. Um, they've said it's extraordinary and it's about time that we declare the case closed. Um, but in the coming months, I'm hoping that many more people will read my book and enjoy it and let their thoughts be known. OK, well, I, I really enjoyed it, despite the harrowing subject matter. Uh, it, was a, it was a good read. It was a great read, uh, Sarah. So thank you very much for coming on and uh, speaking to us. Maybe if, you, if you'd like, you can point people towards where they can find your book, maybe find some more information about what you're up to. Yes, my book, One Armed Jack, is widely available in the shops and online. It's a hardback and it's also an ebook and audio book. I'm currently on Instagram. I'm afraid I'm not the greatest user of social <laughs> media, but if anybody wanted to follow me, I'd probably make a bit more of an effort to um, be engaging um, online. Yeah, uh, I had to be uh, schooled by my 16 year old niece a few months ago on how to use Instagram because that is foreign territory for me as well so I, I suspect you're doing better than I am in that regard but uh for sure but Sarah I really uh, love speaking to you and like I said I really enjoyed the book so thank you very much for giving up uh, some of your evening to speak to us thank you very much indeed it's been a pleasure thank you very much all the best fascinating guest this evening some great just a lot I've learned a lot I'm going to go and digest it. So I've got some bad news and some good news for you. Uh, the bad news is due to some unforeseen circumstances, Sean's had to nip away and he will reschedule uh, the last guest of this evening, which was Billy Luna. Apparently, Billy will be coming back on uh, Saturday. The good news is I'm going to stick around for about six hours and just do some freestyle beatbox poetry. For everyone, I'm kidding. I'm just going to wrap this up uh, and go to bed. Uh, but well, I've got you. Firstly, thank you very much for all your excellent comments, observations that we read. We read all of them for sure. Uh, and, and there were some great questions and, and comments in there today. I've been told by Ash, who just so happens to be the boss of me. Uh, if you get chance, please go and follow us on Locals. That's really taking shape over there, apparently. Uh, we'll be back to the full four-hour show uh, next time. Uh, apparently on Locals, the exclusive uh, content has started to go live today. So head over there uh, and see what that's all about. Put your details in. Uh, and I think that's about it. So thank you, everyone, and have a pleasant morning, afternoon, evening. I don't know where you are. Or do I? Good night.